the growth of the economy of the city whether through payment of rates and all other things. So Johannesburg is a metropolitan city, and cities like Johannesburg, of course, are built even by migrants. We have seen the growth of New York and all other cities in the world. So you are welcome to our city, but I'm more than convinced uh, that we need to, to advance our program on public transport system. Uh, which will be efficient and effective. I've realized when I came here, there were so many cars. I actually thought the hall was full. So it actually means uh, it's one person, one car, uh, which is a problem, which contributes to congestion on our roads. It contributes to infrastructure uh, decay. So we need to up the game on public transport so that you leave your cars and get into the public system so that they don't have a problem of parking. The journalists were complaining of parking when they arrived here. So I think it's one task that Houghton must take it very seriously so that we can resolve it. So my task today is basically to welcome you. I'm the regional chairperson of the ANC in Greater Johannesburg. I'm also serving as a member of the mayoral committee of the city of Johannesburg responsible for finance. We just passed an 80.9 billion budget a week ago, uh, of which we think that budget will help us navigate, especially addressing issues of infrastructure in Johannesburg. Uh, we tried to keep tariffs as low as possible, uh, including the rates and taxes, which we kept at 2%. We uh, would have wished to keep kept it much lesser, but unfortunately, uh, we also need the money to do other things in the city. So you are all welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, you are at the home of Ruth Fest, uh, a center of the ANC, and we hope that the engagements and the dialogue today will be interesting. Uh, the panelists are here. Uh, Oscar is here. He will be then uh, facilitating the session. Mine was just to welcome all of you and enjoy the dialogue. Thanks. Oscar. Oh, by the way, Oscar said on the program there's a chaplain. So he didn't trust that I can pray. <laughs> then we came to a mutual agreement that we'll just observe a moment of meditation, just for a minute or so. Can we observe a moment of meditation? Today's topic is about foreign policy, but it's also going to touch on domestic issues uh, that affects some things throughout the, the length and breadth of the country. And so we want to encourage you. Hopefully you will enjoy today's session. And if so, please do come to future dialogues that the, the ANC will be hosting. Today's uh, dialogue, as you know, is on what some might term the controversial issue of the special military operation, conflict, war between Russia and Ukraine. Uh, I mentioned that quite deliberately because even the terminology that defines this conflict is in dispute. Is it a special military operation? Is it a war? Uh, or is it a conflict? Now, to kickstart the dialogue, we have a number of invitees, uh,
speakers, if I can call it that, people who is going to facilitate the dialogue. Um, I'm going to try and make it as interactive as possible, so to give all of you an opportunity to all. I know that they, are don't, they don't understand that you were not the invited uh, speaker. And so we want to make long announcements and statements and comments. I'm going to cut you short, uh, for sure, as the moderator. Keep it short, keep it sweet, and keep it succinct so that we can all have a chance to participate. Um, we are also live streaming. There are a number of platforms that uh, the dialogue is on. So to please do check your, your smart devices and make sure that you connect as many people as possible. Now, to kickstart the process, before I invite uh, the ambassador to uh, the Federation of Russia to South Africa. I wanted to perhaps uh, get out your pens, uh, speakers. I was going to give you some few provocations, just as a, as a foundation. Provocation number one. Non-alignment is outdated, and the new world order demands that there is no neutrality. That's the first provocation. The second provocation, the UN Charter must at all times be respected, and that means all the articles of the Charter, not only selected few. Provocation number three, the time of Western hegemony, and in particular, US dominance, is over. How do we get to grips with that reality? And finally, provocation number four, the overall emphasis in the world must be that the war, the war, for this war to end with immediate effect, fueling it does not help. I hope that those four provocations will somehow guide the inputs of the various speakers. Of course, some provocations uh, can also come from your side. I'm not the purveyor of all provocations. And some of you might, of course, disagree with some of the, the provocations. So, on that note, welcome everyone, and let the dialogue commence. I want to kickstart the dialogue by inviting we, we did invite, for the record, the ambassador to South Africa from Ukraine, and we also did invite the ambassador of China. Um, they both embassies, unfortunately, indicated that they will not be able to honor the invitation, but we are very, we are very, very happy that the Russian Federation ambassador is here today. Um, at least we will get some perspective from Ambassador Rogachev. And on that note, let me not waste any time and invite the Ambassador to please come to the podium. Thank you. Okay, good, good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for very much for your interest. It's an honor and it's a pleasure to be here. And um, uh, I'm very happy to be in this situation, in this position, to be able to provide you with some details and uh, Russian perspectives on what's going on in Ukraine, because what you can read here uh, is, is mostly well, half-truths at best. Otherwise, it's uh, a lot of lies, or lots of fabricated news, uh, lots of staged scenarios, and so on. Uh, well, um, I can speak really for hours about that, but I would like to um, 
suggest, I think, two of the most important theses on this. The first one is that the special military operation in Ukraine, or the conflict, or the war, uh, I, I think you can call it anyway. Uh, what was important initially uh, for us uh, is to call it special military operation because purposes and uh, methods and the scale of military involvement uh, were very, very limited. Now it's growing and uh, it's very difficult to predict where is the limit to spreading of this conflict. Ukraine is being supplied with more and more arms, as you know. Uh, countries that have had assigned initially themselves certain red lines, like not supplying long-range artillery to Ukraine, then not supplying uh, rocket launchers, not supplying heavy, advanced heavy uh, uh, machinery, tanks, and so on not to supply advanced uh, air defense systems, not to supply uh, fighters. They have crossed these lines. Um, and uh, we, wh wh where will they stop? We do not know. Wh is weapons of mass destruction is the limit? Is it? So, um, um, special military operation, SMO, uh, conflict war in Ukraine, I mean, for lawyers that would make a difference. I don't think that for the purposes of our discussions today it will make a difference. But uh, the point is that it should be looked at and assessed in order to be better understood. It should be placed in a wider context, geopolitical context. It is absolutely clear that most of the population in both Russia and Ukraine didn't want this war. It was a necessity. I think that our president made it very clear, speaking on numerous occasions, that we were compelled to do this by NATO expansion since 1991 when the fundamental promise not to expand NATO to the East was made. Uh, and then in five waves, NATO did expand to the East. And then of the six, well, it's difficult to call it a wave, but then Finland decided to join NATO. That was a sixth time NATO expanded to the East. So um, this is one. And then, of course, uh, the substance that um, the system of arms control was basically dismantled by the United States, consequently living in unilaterally withdrawing from a number of arms uh, reduction and arms control treaties uh, by uh, appropriating and cultivating in the military sense the territories of the new NATO member states. And the latest was placing um, elements of anti-ballistic missile systems in the territory of Poland and Romania. And we were told that they are directed against Iran. Iranian rockets can't fly there, for God's sake. So, uh, uh, and we know also that uh, these systems uh, or, uh, of anti-ballistic uh, missile elements, they can be uh, remodeled uh, in, in uh, launching pads of the same missiles in, in a little bit more than an hour. So uh, this is really an argument for the fools. Uh, and then, uh, of course, with the territory of Ukraine um, being, uh, you know, customized in the same sense, uh, being prepared for the deployment of NATO troops, American troops in particular, was, was the red line. And we have warned about that dozens of times in dozens of formats for dozens of years. Then, of course, I should mention 
the uh, rewriting of uh, uh, NATO strategy, which became more and more aggressive and assertive. Um, in particular, uh, about the use of nuclear arms, the uh, ceiling was lowered, in particular, significantly in the last time it was rewritten, uh, very re recently. And then, of course, uh, NATO consecutively proclaiming the zone of its interest more and more to the east, and now the latest uh, spread of uh, its zone of interest uh, became Southeast Asia. You can read all this in NATO papers. Don't take my word for it. Search and read and you will see it. So uh, the argument that NATO is a defensive alliance and is not threatening anybody, again, it's, uh, I, I don't know who, 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 who can buy this. Uh, certainly not us. But uh, especially uh, the, the serious case was with the territory of Ukraine because in particular the flight time of uh, cruise missiles from the northeast of Ukraine to Moscow is five to seven minutes. And uh, preparations for NATO deployment in, in, U in the territory of Ukraine uh, has begun, we know, in uh, Odessa, in another port a city on the Black Sea, and uh, some uh, ground troops, in particularly equipped with, armed with uh, uh, cruise missiles, were supposed to appear uh, in the territory of Ukraine pretty soon. Regardless of whether Ukraine becoming or not NATO member. This is, this is uh, important because uh, now uh, there are speculations and uh, you know, there are again half-truths about NATO not being ready to, to accept Ukraine within its ranks. Well, uh, it was said in 2008 that Ukraine in Georgia are to become, where to become NATO members. It is written black in English, as we said. Uh, so um, it's all just, just tricks to distract attention from the very fact that NATO troops, NATO armaments were supposed to appear in the territory of Ukraine very soon. And then, of course, uh, the military buildup of, uh, in Ukraine uh, on the national level. The army was trained by NATO instructors, was uh, trained by NATO standards, it was equipped and armed by NATO standards. So um, basically what we had to face at least in at the initial stage, but also now, because uh, at least six NATO countries provide military assistance in terms of training of the uh, Ukrainian military personnel. Otherwise, it's about 50 countries. It's more than NATO. It's the whole collective West, the so-called historic West, that assists Ukraine in, in this uh, conflict, SMO war. Um, so, uh, and according we, we suspected uh, for quite some time that Ukrainian troops were uh, being prepared to attack into the east, into the Donbass region, to crush the descent of the Russian population in Donetsk and Lugansk uh, regions, republics as they have proclaimed themselves. And we did not recognize it until February last year. Uh, Russia has not recognized Donetsk and Lugansk as separate republics, separate states, till February 2022. This is for the record. Um, and into Crimea. And uh, the ongoing war uh, against these eastern parts of Ukraine, civil war in Ukraine, took lives of 12 to 14, according to different accounts, 12 to 14,000 of civilians. And my colleague, who uh, thoroughly avoids to face me in different talk shows and on different events, 
Lyubov uh, Pravitova, usually mentions that, but what she forgets to mention is that who killed these 12 to 14,000 people? Oh, well, according to Ukrainian narrative, it's they were shooting themselves. It's like uh, Russian troops are shelling Zaporozhye nuclear power plant where Russian troops are stationed. Or like uh, Russia blew up Nord Stream pipelines, it, its own infrastructure in, in which we invested heavily, and, and so on. Uh, but some people believe these narratives uh, because they are repeated so much, um, so many times. So uh, th th this is one element uh, that I would like uh, for you to consider, that uh, this conflict should be viewed uh, in uh, geopolitical, strategic uh, terms, strategic scale, like um, uh, uh, clash between historic West trying to expand its hegemony, its dominance in the world at the expenses of other countries, in particular Russia, as a major contender or opponent to, to this. And then, um, unfortunately, very unfortunately, very regrettably, uh, Ukrainians uh, in, in the large part agreeing to be the spearhead of, of this, uh, to be a military force that would uh, really try to harm Russia. That purpose was proclaimed by the Western leaders on dozens of occasions, that the purpose is uh, to harm Russia, to inflict uh, Russia uh, strategic uh, Sorry, what I lost the word. Um, so, so uh, to to, uh, um, to take over in, in the military sense over Russian Federation forces uh, and so on. Um, it is very unfortunate that that uh, people that are so close to us uh, have have seems to agree uh, to be this this spearhead. Another um, thesis that I would like to propose to your attention is that, uh, yes, um, to taking this, this situation on the global scale, uh, one should uh, take into account that it is the hybrid war that uh, the West uh, uh, carries out against Russian Federation. Um, look, uh, it, it's not about uh, using military strength uh, of, of uh, Ukraine and their manpower mostly. Uh, but uh, Russia has been uh, accused of weaponizing uh, grain trade, weaponizing and fertilize trade and fertilizers and so on. Excuse me, with economic sanctions imposed against Russia, and we're not the first country, by no means, there are dozens of countries who have suffered from economic sanctions imposed by the collective West prior to this episode, Iran, North Korea, Cuba, and dozens of others, so the whole economic uh, cooperation, interaction, was weaponized by the West for decades already. Um, and then uh, it is part of the hybrid war. Uh, the part of it uh, is expropriation of all kinds of Russian assets, be it state or private abroad. All these principles of inviolability, of private property, and so on, rule of law, free trade, have been abandoned, that the West preached to the rest of the world for decades, if not centuries, they have been abandoned. And then uh, an attempt to cancel everything Russian, to in particular uh, prohibit playing Russian classical music, uh, to uh, expel Russian 
uh, sportsmen from all kinds of international competition. Baron Pierre de Coubertin is now turning in his coffin. Uh, but uh, the French government is, is not shy of it. It's, uh, it is supported. It is supported by many countries. Uh, so sports should be besides politics, uh, above politics. Uh, wh what was the slogan that, that uh, Pierre de Coubertin put forward? How it is worded in English? I'm not sure, but uh, everything has been abandoned. So this is a hybrid war. And uh, one of the most important elements of it is uh, the information war. And this is what we're facing here, in particular in South Africa, in the world as well, but in particularly in South Africa, as most of the media are re simply repeating the lies that are spread by the mainstream media, the global media uh, all around the world. Um, and here, some media are echoed. Do I have five minutes remaining, or it's in total <laughs> five minutes <laughs> remaining? Thank you. Okay, uh, I'll do my best. Um, so, uh, information as well is is weaponized, and uh, the algorithm that is being used is pretty simple. And you could trace it, in fact, uh, on so many examples, dozens and hundreds of examples, because uh, it, it consists in the following. The commentators, anchormen, journalists, writing journalists, uh, they say, Russia has started this unprovoked, unjustified war against Ukraine. Look what's going on. Look what this terrible Russians are doing. And uh, then you have these uh, pictures on TV screens, you have videos on the internet, and you have uh, photos in, in uh, newspapers that are showing you don't know exactly what. It can hardly be identified. And at least half of the stories, they are simply made up there were so many uh, staged uh, incidents and fabricated stories like the famous Bucha where African presidents were taken because it, it has been debunked. The materials are available on the internet. There are agencies and investigative journalists who do follow these regular lies and who debunked them in particular, and, and that was the case with Bucha. The day prior to the incident uh, th th that is usually taken as a description of Russian atrocities when 100 or 200 of civilians were killed, the mayor of Bucha gave interview on this central street, and behind him there were no dead bodies. And that was the day prior to when these bodies appeared and were uh, shown to the world as a proof of a terrible atrocities of Russia. But we know that there were many uh, people from the UK and other Western countries and they brought these bodies from other places and uh, in a very particular manner how they were then uh, buried without any relatives and without any village people coming uh, to, to, to participate in this procedure and so it's, it just proves that they were brought from other places and, and there are almost all stories are like that like a preg two pregnant women straddling on the you know uh, pile of rocks which were supposedly uh, uh, a maternity hospital uh, the, 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 the day and, and were, was destroyed by the Russian missile Local people uh, identified this woman. It was the same woman, actually. She just put other clothes and then mascara on herself. And then she gave birth in Donetsk, in the city of Donetsk, on the Russian-speaking, at least, side, uh, a couple of months later on. And she acknowledged that. And other stories that were made up, like uh, one mentioned uh, 
by, by a diplomat uh, in, in one of the newspapers, like Russian troops using rape as method of warfare. Now, th that was just too much, uh, because even Ukrainians have fired uh, their Lyubov uh, Denisova, their human rights ombudsman, as they thought that this is too much, this is propaganda, these were lies. And she admitted herself, after being fired, that she fabricated these stories. But these stories are repeated again and again and again by some shameless people, shameless journalists, propagandists. And um, uh, because of the difference in resources that we have and, and the MSMs have, it's uh, becoming a, a mainstream narrative, and very unfortunately. So um, uh, this, this is another uh, thesis that I would like to, to suggest to you that uh, never in human history has uh, a warfare or a, a, a hostile campaign against the state being conducted with such a terrible degree of propaganda, lies, falsifications, fabrications, uh, and uh, that uh, information is, uh, be, has been weaponized uh, and it is widely, widely used in this situation. As I'm, I'm yes, uh, just one thirty seconds. Um, neutrality. The, the, to, to answer one of your provocations, you remember how it all started. Um, well, um, let me begin uh, again. Uh, I do not think that uh, in the modern world there is a place for neutrality. For a very simple reason. Uh, the tendency that was uh, initiated uh, by George Bush Jr., who said uh, 20, some 20 years ago that either you are with us or you are against us. And that was said, uh, um, that was applicable to the situation of fighting terrorism. But since then, this slogan has been spread to other areas of uh, human activities, of international relations. And uh, the very latest example of uh, these uh, logic, of this algorithm brought to, to the apogee is the 11th uh, package of sanctions against Russia, which is basically aimed not at Russia, but at those who do not comply with the sanctions Im imposed against Russia. So you cannot remain neutral. You will be punished by secondary sanctions if you do not apply sanctions against Russia. So it's you are either with Russia and you are being punished or you are with the West. This is the logic. They will not allow you to remain neutral and uh, equally distanced. Um, uh, this is one. And the secondly, we, the relation to the, uh, all the provisions of uh, UN Charter, yes, uh, other principles are often mentioned in the context of a relationship between Russia and Ukraine, but uh, I would also like to remind the audience that there is such a principle as a right to self-defense. And uh, in the situation as we see it, that we do not see it limited just to our relation with Ukraine, but on the much larger scale, it is the right of self-defense being exercised. Thank you very much. I can take your questions. Thanks. Yes, yes. The, you, I'm told you have to go out that way. We don't want to be sued. There's some steps there, at least. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador. Let's have another round of applause uh, for the uh, Russian Ambassador. I thought, I thought it important to allow the ambassador to uh, ex expand on his points because, precisely because of the point that he's making, which is that there is a lot of misinformation that is making the rounds generally. Uh, we would recall, for example, uh, a very disturbing thing, which was that as soon as the war started, Russian TV was switched off um, because they didn't want there to be a different uh, perspective 
uh, to what mainstream Western media was saying. Having said that, Ambassador, you will agree with me, there are, of course, contesting narratives to everything that you have said. That is why we are here. Um, I saw some people were shaking their heads in disagreement and so forth, and we will hopefully allow people to share those, those disagreements. But thank you very much for that candid input. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to also welcome the Secretary General of the ANC. Uh, you are more, most welcome, esteemed uh, NEC member. <laughs> um, and in that regard, I also want to acknowledge, I forgot to mention, you know, with diplomats you have to be very careful with protocols and so forth, uh, unless we, we are boycotted for the, next, uh, for the next meeting. But there is a number of representatives, ambassadors, um, from various embassies. Um, I'm not going to put my foot in it and try and mention them because I might miss one or two and offend some of you, but please, uh, among others, we have uh, ambassadors and representatives here from the French Embassy, from the DRC, from Central African Republic, from Venezuela, from Mozambique, um, and Congo, Brazil. Uh, you are all welcome uh, to... Ah, uh, sorry, and the Ambassador of Norway. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, thank you. And Zimbabwe. Oh, uh, I told you, they get very sensitive about these things. Uh, <laughs> and Burundi, yeah, thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, you are all welcome, you are welcome. I knew I shouldn't have gone there, but in any event. Uh, <laughs> um, a number of good points, as I say, we might not agree with all of them, misinformation and psychological warfare, uh, the potential of nuclear war. Everyone is always talking about it, and it scares us here in Africa. Um, NATO expansion eastwards, weaponizing of the US dollar through sanctions, and also, which of course is close to the hearts of the Russian people, you know, trying to make Russian culture, language, and so forth extinct in, in other parts of the world. Um, so we take those points, Ambassador. Thank you very much. I'm going to ask the, also an Ambassador, Lindy Zulu, also an NEC member of the ANC, a dear friend, um, but she also was the Chair of the International Relations Subcommittee of the African National Congress, and in that regard, I would want her to share with us her few comments. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Program Director. It's a pleasure for me to be here today and let me make it very clear from the onset. I stand here in front of you as a member of the African National Congress, a member of the National Executive Committee, and a member of the International Relations Subcommittee. So when you listen to me, don't add other things into it. This is who I am. And this is what I'm representing um, today. And I, I clarify this because I don't want uh, problems tomorrow, people saying, oh, she's a minister of social development, oh, she's whatever. Um, I, I've been a diplomat and I've been in the Department of International Relations and it, it helps uh, for the National Congress uh, to pull on its resources uh, across the board, including um, its resources and partnership with alliance partners, and I'm sure some alliance partners are here today. But of course, in salutation, um, the Secretary General of the African National Congress, Comrade Figile Mbalula, is here, and uh, some other National Executive Committee members are here. I won't name them by name. I'm hoping that uh, the Women's League and the Youth League in particular is here because the Youth League is the, um, is the people that the African National Congress is looking towards to make sure that uh, when the veterans retire, they would have shared all the necessary information experience so that they can take the country to the next level, but as well as take the African continent to the next level. And then the ambassadors who are here, thank you very much for all of you taking the opportunity. And I do want to say to you, the culture that has always been there 
of the African National Congress, and in particular the international relations, engaging with yourselves from an ANC perspective at all times is very important for us because we must always clarify that it is the African National Congress that develops the policy positions, that develops programs of how this country needs to be taken forward, both internally and internationally. And the African National Congress expects that the cadres who have been deployed, I repeat again, we have been deployed because that's exactly uh, what is happening. We are deployed in government in order for us to make sure that the decisions that are taken by the African National Congress in collaboration with the Alliance partners are kept alive by ensuring that it is implemented. And I was saying earlier on in the meeting when we are here that yes, that relationship and that um, the ANC and government, there are times when we might seem not to be in the same page. We do understand and appreciate that diplomacy is not something that um, you cook in your own little kitchen. Diplomacy is influenced by a whole lot of things, but diplomacy must in the main also be guided by human rights. Diplomacy must also be guided by the interests that we have to serve and the interests that we serve are supposed to be the interests of the people overall. And so as I stand here today, I want to recall very quickly, just before the conflict started, the African National Congress uh, and its alliance partners always discusses the geopolitics and how the geopolitics have got an impact on our lives and our lives in particular with regard to peace, security, stability, and the development of South Africa and also of the African continent. So what the ambassador was talking about earlier on here, tracing back where this whole um, conflict we are finding ourselves in today, it is a discussion that the African National Congress and its alliance partners had been engaging in Maybe what I think we should say is that we should have been much more robust, much more faster in discussing it, and then engaging even much more quicker than to wait until the conflict is uh, started in the manner in which it started. And therefore, the movements that the ambassador was speaking about here were issues that we had been engaging on as the African National Congress, both at the Committee of International Relations, but also taking it, tracing it even to the res some decisions of the National Executive Committee, including the Conference of the African National Congress. And I recall very well, and Comrade Welile in particular will recall, that right at the beginning, we had to ask the Department of International Relations to come to the African National Congress and give us a brief of what they were seeing, what were they experiencing, because we are an organization, a political party, obviously, they are government, and they keep the bilateral um, relationships with the, the rest of the world, and we asked them to come along and tell us what they were seeing. That's a, a, a history for another day, but I do want to say one of the issues that got us really talking was how do we engage the ambassadors who are here of Russia and Ukraine. And I want to put that into perspective because right at the beginning when it started, it was said we are only engaging the Russian ambassador. And it was also said, oh, of course, what do we expect out of people like uh, Hindi Wezulu who are, uh, are, are beneficiaries of having been students uh, in Russia? Yes, I was a student in Russia. Yes, I got my master's degree there. Yes, I was not the only one who was there. Yes, we were supported because we were in a liberation struggle. And many of us had wanted to go to the West, to America and other places. But the scholarships, the bulk of the scholarships that we got were that scholarships that came from the overall socialist countries. And so to isolate Russia alone in that instance, for me, was not right. Second thing that I want to also put into perspective was that even if one had studied in Russia and uh, uh, Russia, Soviet Union, we must always make the difference also. 
Soviet Union that supported it, uh, uh, supported us at the time. That does not mean when we are today in government and there are things that we do not agree with, we will then say, oh, no, we are afraid of telling it like the way we see it, like the way we feel it. And so put it into perspective, I did have meetings with the ambassador of Russia, and I did have meetings with the ambassador of Ukraine. Not only did I have a meeting with the ambassador of Ukraine, when they had an in, a, 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 a minister visiting here, and she requested us to have that meeting, I did go there because as per the mandate of the African National Congress. So I wanted to put that into perspective so that it is appreciated and understood that in this dialogue that we're having today, we have always been directed by the Freedom Charter, which, uh, and I want to quote, and I, I, I started with the Freedom Charter because the Freedom Charter still lives for us. Some people might not think so. And we look at the people then who adopted the Freedom Charter, who had a vision, long-term vision, not a vision of the time that they were drawing the Freedom Charter. And this is a, a, a timeless guidance of the Freedom Charter where we, the people of South Africa, emphatically stated that at the time, and I quote, respect the rights and sovereignty of all nations. We shall strive to maintain world peace and the settlement of all international disputes by negotiations, not war. Peace and friendship amongst all our people shall be secured by upholding the equal rights, opportunities, and status of all." Unquote. Now, we didn't write this yesterday. It was written by our leaders. It was written by the people who decided to come together led by the African National Congress, looking even at the time at the geopolitics. And writing this was because they had a foresight. And it is for this reason uh, that as uh, the African National Congress, in all the discussions that we have had, we've always said what guides us is ensuring that we work towards peace, security, and stability, not only in the African continent, but in the world. But also we are conscious of the fact that whenever there's a war, any conflict anywhere else, it is bound to affect us. And if it is bound to affect us, what do we do? Our first point is, how do we come to a point of finding peace even in that conflict? And therefore, moving from there, it is on these well-founded premises that last week, the, pre the week that happened, uh, and and, and the representing the core principles of the ANC alliance, our president, Comrade Siri Ramaphosa, led, led a delegation of African heads of state and governments to make respective representations to President Zelensky and President Vladimir Putin. And these were contained in the 10-point plan at whose center is peace, friendship, neighborliness, and mutually beneficial economic productivity between and in the Russian Federation and Ukraine. Central to the 10-point plan is the realization of peace that is beneficial for Africans, in particular humanity as a whole. The 10-point plan embodies the enjoyment of abundant prosperity by all Africans and the improvement of the quality of life of each and every African. And here I think it's very important for us to note that President Cyril Ramaphosa didn't wake up one morning and decide he's just going to call these African leaders and then they are going to get into an airplane and go to Russia. There was a long process and the diplomats will tell you of the lengthy processes, the discussions that happened and as to whether the meeting must start in Russia or the meeting must start in Ukraine. And but the first and most important thing that they had to grapple with was can we get the two presidents of the two countries to agree to meeting with the leaders of the African continent. And also, I can tell you that um, within the African continent itself, it's not to say, I have five minutes, that's what he said. It's not to say it became automatic that when the president and South Africa decides we want to come together collectively as Africans get the AU, get the African leaders, 
to also believe in what we're putting forward. The diplomats will also tell you that before you get there, there's a whole lot of toing and froing. Some people fly to some principals, I mean to some uh, capitals, some going to different areas to go and try and get the African continent itself to agree to a common approach. And you know, as well as I do, that when you go to the AU and you are bringing things like this, which is a conflict, and especially because you have people who are wanting to divide and rule you. You will be wanting to come together and others will go to the other presidents and say, no, you must not agree uh, uh, to South Africa. But ultimately, what happened is that that seed that was planted in the African National Congress a long time ago, that we must find peace, stability and security uh, in, in our countries. So the ambassador has dealt with the background of how NATO started creeping in slowly but surely and obviously threatening the peace uh, of Russia and I don't want to get into that whole discussion because I think the others who are here are going to be able to deal with that. But here is my last point, is that as if Africans are entering the season of vindication, the global community now says the historical decision of the ANC that government to be among the co-founders of BRICS configuration was correct from the onset. And comrades, the season is not is only at its inception as the majority of the world's population stands to benefit from and seeks to align itself with the vigorous and irreversible force of today. Yesterday was a cause of smacks, laughter, scorn and alienation. Yes, we are on the right side of history. And we stand here also having been part and parcel of the development of the formation of the BRICS uh, itself. Likewise, the season of education is set to continue as we stand in unflinching in our call for peace in Ukraine, where violence has never ended violence and justice never begotten justice. The African National Congress is saying warmongering will not end the current conflict in Ukraine. Instead, it truly threatens to end the prospect of continued life as we know it uh, on Earth. And so, inspired by the quest to realize peace that is beneficial for Africans, as well as secure their enjoyment of abundant prosperity and improve the quality of life of each and every African and founded on the African Unity's Agenda 2063, the Africa we want the delegation of African heads of state and governments that presented solid 10-point plan to President Vladimir Putin of the Russian Federation as well as President Volodymyr Zelensky of Ukraine respectively were legitimately speaking for the core of interest of the majority of the African population. In our instance, as the African National Congress-led alliance, these core interests are historically founded in the Freedom Charter and were re-articulated for the purpose of realizing peace in Russia and Ukraine. I thank you very much. Thank you very much, Comrade uh, Lindewey. There you have this perspective. I think what we are going to do now, colleagues, is to open it up. Let's have a bit of uh, a discussion, question and answers, comments. Um, I think we'll start here with the ambassador from Norway. One, there's a mic there, two. Okay. Do we have another one? Three. Anyone else? Four. Let's have that, those four. Please continue. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Oscar, and thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, Norway, I'm an ambassador of Norway, I'm in South Korea, and I can obviously not represent Ukraine, uh, but I'm very happy that I can give this perspective from Norway on the conflict in Europe. Uh, and I might be lengthy, so uh, you, <laughs> you have to cut me off uh, if it goes too far. So yesterday I met with uh, Abdul Minti, which I think many of you know here. 
He was uh, secretary of the anti-apartheid movement in the UK from the 60s and onwards. Uh, and he was also based in Norway, working with the uh, doing research on actually links between the apartheid state and Israel when it comes to nuclear arms. And he talked about uh, when he first came to Norway in the 60s, this was not long after Albert Lutuli had gotten the Peace Prize. And uh, the only political party on this continent that Norwegians knew about, ah, that was the ANC. <laughs> so, uh, and he also talked about uh, the political leaders in Norway and uh, how they saw the fight for freedom in South Africa during, through the lens of the Second World War. Uh, in 1940, Norway was uh, occupied by uh, Nazi Germany. Uh, there was a resistance fight. Um, uh, in 1945, we became free. Uh, and uh, we were threatened by the Allies, but we were also clearly strongly helped by the Soviet Union in Northern Norway. So the Soviet Union helped us get rid of uh, Nazis in Norway. So, then uh, it was important for Norwegians to support the anti-apartheid movement. Uh, and it was a very broad engagement across society. Um, politicians got involved quite early. And um, for us, it's the same thing. We were fighting against uh, German occupation, self-determination, in South Africa, ANC and other forces were fighting for self-determination and freedom. And when you look at Ukraine, it's the same thing. They are fighting for self-determination and freedom. The same principle. That is what is at stake. So, the problem for Russia is not really NATO. The problem is democracy. They don't have democracy inside the country because the leadership don't allow it. If you take a white paper like this and walk on the red square and say peace, you will be put in jail. No freedom, no democracy. But they also want to prevent other countries in the neighborhood from having freedom and democracy. NATO never had a plan to expand. But as countries became independent after the fall of the Soviet Union, they want to keep their independence. They want to stay free. They want self-determination, just like you wanted, just like Norway wanted during the Second World War. That's the principle which is at stake. And they feel threatened, and they apply for NATO membership, because that can give them certainty that they will stay free and independent. So again, the issue is not about NATO expanding. It's about democracy expanding. And that today's Russia have a big problem with that. That's the issue. We can talk about principles. <coughs> yeah. And I think in the geopolitical shifting and challenging times, principles are very key for all countries. And the most important principle, that is non-intervention in other states, as we see in the UN Charter. That UN Charter was written with a backdrop of 50 million dead, in the Second World War. You know, European states, and you know on this continent, they had a tradition of doing foreign policy through might is right. I have more weapons than you, I have more soldiers than you, I take what is mine. They did that in Europe, they did that on this continent. So, the former colonial powers in Western Europe have changed. Russia has basically not changed. They think of a land empire that they will dominate, and uh, that's why this aggression against Ukraine is completely counterproductive. Also for them, Sweden and uh, Finland had no plan to join NATO. <laughs> but of course, when Russia, our neighbor, attack another neighbor, which is Ukraine, of course, they want to keep their independence. They want to safeguard their democracy. Sweden and Finland has centuries of democracy. And Russia, they think in terms of spheres of influence. No, no. Countries that are around us have to behave in this and this way. They cannot be free, independent countries. So, that is a crucial issue. Fake news, yeah, there's a lot of that. Um, the Russian ambassador mentioned my OPEP. I have some copies here, I'd be glad to share. And there was the UN Special Rapporteur on Sexual Violence. She said that Russian troops use rape as a weapon of war. 
you can complain to the UN if you want. It's the UN investigators that has revealed all the atrocities that Russian soldiers have committed in Ukraine. I mean, and atrocities in Ukraine. I mean, when you send hundreds and thousands of soldiers with a lot of weapons into the country from several um, crossing lines on the border, and they start shooting, and then you send rockets, of course you will harm civilians in a massive scale. There is only one aggressor. But Ukraine has the right to self-defense. No way we will support Ukraine with weapons, humanitarian aid, development aid, reconstruction aid, as long as Ukraine think they need it. And our support is in line with the UN Charter, because you can help countries that are a victim of pure aggression. There is one element that is often forgotten in the South African debate, and that's the Budapest Memorandum from 1994. So after the breakup of the Soviet Union, uh, Ukraine gave up all the nuclear weapons. They were a huge nuclear power. They gave up all the nuclear weapons. In return, they got the memorandum that said that the Russia's territorial integrity should forever stay there. No one should interfere in Ukraine's affair. The country should stay independent with the territory it used to have in 1994. So that was the deal that Russia signed, UK signed, and the US signed. So this is the most flagrant violation of that memorandum, is the invasion in 2014 to take Crimea, and then of course 2022. But it also started in 2008 with uh, taking a part of Georgia. So you all have to ask yourself, why is all Europeans so united against Russia's aggression? Because we have seen this before. It's the mightiest right attitude that we have seen for centuries before that you also suffered through on this continent. I have a big army, I can do as I please. And nuclear weapons, well, who is thinking about using those? That's the Russians again. So, we have to take the bigger picture into account. And again, it's not about NATO. It's about Russia's wish to keep an empire Russia's wish to use the all typical European way of solving conflicts, might is right, I have a big army. Thank you. So I can do what I want. Okay. Thanks. Thank, okay. thank you very much. Firstly, I... Please introduce yourself. My name is Chirizi Mnyai. The first thing I need to salute our Secretary General's presence here before this debate. And I think we need to support our President Cyril Ramaphosa for the peace efforts in the context of the Freedom Charter, that there shall be peace and friendship. And also, South Africa will advance the settlement of all international disputes by negotiation, but not war. I must start by supporting our President's position in that regard. One point is that uh, that I want to advance is that Russia did not go to Ukraine to start the war. They went to Ukraine to stop the war because there was already Russians that were killed by Ukraine inside their own territory. What does the ambassador of Norway say about 52 biological weapon placed in Ukraine? targeting the Russian sovereignty. Remember the principle of self-defense. It's critical. What do you say when, uh, when the, the neighbor is, is loaded with all ammunition, anti-defense ammunition, the whole historical West is pumping Ukraine with ammunition against Russia. Is that democracy? What type of democracy that really set fix other countries than the other? The Western democracy is about uh, destruction of that. Remember, they invaded Ukraine, you know what called uh, Iraq, on the basis of what weapon mass 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 yeah mass weapon of mass destruction, which were never there. They Iran, everything, they are bombing everywhere. Now you are 
you are sending the bombs, infrastructure, tankers, and everything again next to the Russian borders. In international relations, sovereignty is everything. You must remember, Chairperson, that Russia took all the efforts to engage in the diplomatic peace by engaging diplomatically. By 2014, they took comedian in Ukraine by the back door to make him the president. Why? Why the whole world doesn't go and support support the, the, the people of Palestine who are bombed against apartheid Israel? Why they don't do that? What type of democracy that doesn't go and support Palestine? Where is the principle? So lastly, I must say that Russia is defending its sovereignty against the historical uh, Western uh, countries who are all mobilized by the United States to fight against Russia. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Pesi Kisibane from the University of Johannesburg. Uh, mine is a question to the Russian ambassador. We can't hear you, my brother. Hi, I'm, I'm audible now. Yeah. Okay. My name is Pesi Klesibane from the University of Johannesburg, and mine is a question to the Russian ambassador. Um, as you saw that the, our president and members of the AU uh, went to Russia and Ukraine for peace talks, um, most of them you'd understand they took a non-alignment stance on this whole geopolitical issue. But I want to comment on economic interaction. You know that the price of grain is very high because of um, wheat and grain fertilizers, uh, uh, which mainly we get from these two countries. So in opening up the shores, um, would the Russian Federation and Kremlin consider um, um, opening their shores in terms of trade so that African countries cannot merely be um, affected very much in terms of trade, especially on wheat and grain and fertilizers. Thank you. Thank you. And then the last one. Yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Prophet Director. My name is Joseph Pilangeni. I am the ANC Deputy Secretary for Zone 16 here in Greater Johannesburg, which is the hosting zone. Uh, I have two very short questions. The first one is to the Russian ambassador. Um, you did mention that Russia gave multiple warnings or concerns regarding NATO or Western forces expansion to the east. And you did mention that some of the purposes for this was either to diminish Russia's influence in the world or to harm Russia. I'd just like to know, Mr. Ambassador, why? what is the main reason why you think that these concerns or these warnings were not taken seriously? And my second question is to Minister Zuma. Minister, you did mention that we are guided by the Freedom Charter. But with this non-alignment or this um, attitude of you are either with us or against us, do you still think non-alignment is the best um, pathway or the best way to go for South Africa's national interest? Thank you. Okay, thank you. I think uh, if we can get that mic to the Ambassador. Thanks. Ambassador, would you like to respond? Thank you. Yes, thank you. And uh, if you allow me, I would like to begin with the last question because it uh, seems to me a, a very important one. And uh, in fact, uh, you could infer uh, the answer from what I've said uh, from my first thesis that I made. Uh, if you look at uh, this situation from the global perspective, from the perspective of geopolitics, uh, you would understand that, in fact, again, it, it, it is not between us and Ukrainians. It is not bes between Moscow and Kiev. It is between uh, the collective West and Russia as it's, as perhaps they see it, most dangerous opponent in this situation. Um, this is, uh, in fact, the, the, the struggle is for the multipolar world, for this world being brought closer by this. And uh, again, don't take my word for it, search for yourselves 
and you will find plenty of comments by Western commentators, political uh, commentators, uh, experts, uh, saying basically that uh, if Russia wins militarily, then the world will be multipolar. Period. This is what they are afraid of. This is why this exasperation and so many lies and so on. Uh, uh, so this is why the West is so united in assisting Ukraine. Again, it's, it's not just the 31 uh, NATO member states. It's about 50 who are providing assistance. It's the whole collective West. And we are alone. We're not asking, we're, <laughs> but because we're not asking, we're not receiving any assistance. But uh, hundreds of billions of US dollars have been pumped, pumped already in Ukraine. Uh, just uh, over 60 billion in purely military assistance and over 100 in all kinds of other assistance. Not a single United Nations or other developmental program in this period has been fully financed. All UN developmental programs are derailed because all money goes to Ukraine. Because this is Ukraine is more important to them, to the West, than anything else, than any sustainable developmental goals, 2063 agenda, climate change, and so on. Uh, there is no other explanation, think logically, and, and uh, you will agree with me, I hope. So, but uh, to say so, um, um, for the grain deal, uh, perhaps I should mention that one. Um, now, the, the of course, um, there are uh, certain difficulties that the world experience is experiencing in terms of food security, energy security, uh, and, and, and in some other areas, uh, of course. Uh, and, uh, you know, that there is a shortcut, and, uh, it, it, which is not correct uh, to blame at all on uh, uh, Russia-Ukraine conflict, meaning that Russia is the reason for all that. Uh, this is not true, again, uh, if, if you, well, you're interested in economy, I wouldn't say that you're, if you're a great expert in, in, in economics, but uh, you should remember, for example, that uh, energy markets have become uh, very uh, jittery uh, long before the special military operation in Ukraine started. In September 2021, price of uh, gas, natural gas, in European markets uh, reached uh, 1,400 uh, uh, 1400, uh, US dollars per 1,000 cubic meters. It was uh, half a year prior to the SMO. Uh, the uh, price for the wheat uh, and other grains uh, was oscillating uh, at very high levels for quite some time. What is the reason for this? The reason is mistakes, erroneous policies conducted by the West on the macroeconomic level. And the first one is that uh, uh, Russia used, and prior to it USSR, for decades we used to supply a very cheap energy uh, to, to Europe. And uh, they enjoyed and prospered on that. Uh, in particular, uh, due to the very long-term uh, uh, agreements, contracts on supplying of natural gas. And the price mechanism was set there, and it, uh, the price dependent derived uh, from the price of oil with a certain lag, six months lag. It, it's, uh, uh, the, the mechanism is uh, uh, more complex than that. But still, it provided uh, volumes of uh, fuel uh, for very stable price conditions. Now, the European Commission told us, well, this is not a market economy. These long-term contracts, like 20, 25-year long-term contracts, this, this is not market economy. No, 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 no. The prices should be established on the spot market, in Amsterdam in particular. And this is what they got. They, they cancelled one contract after another, and uh, 
with the uh, lack of uh, gas, natural gas coming from other sources, they had these uh, price hikes uh, on natural gas in the European markets. Uh, and, and it was, it's, SMO in Ukraine has nothing to do with it. Now for grain, it's a, a somewhat different story. Uh, but uh, another factor in, in, in all this is uh, the fact that during the COVID uh, pandemic, uh, Western countries, US in particular, Japan, uh, in Europe, European Union, they pumped billions, uh, trillions, I wrote uh, somewhere, uh, trillions of uh, dollars and euros and, uh, well, for yens it's, it's uh, quadrillions, perhaps, uh, into their economies. Uh, in order to, to support the population, yes, uh, we, we, we know all this. Uh, we have gone through that as well. But uh, uh, th that was quite irresponsible. The volumes were quite irresponsible. Somebody corrected me about billions, but no. Uh, US uh, printed at least four trillion dollars. Japan printed quadrillions of, of uh, yens and, and trillions uh, of absolutely unsubstantiated uh, by any goods or services of uh, euros were pumped into uh, economies of uh, European states. So where did all this money go? They went to the commodities markets. All commodities grew up, uh, grew in, in, in prices. That was a direct consequence of this thoughtless policy, uh, unrestrained, unmeasured, uh, not related against any economic realities. And uh, so uh, the people who were, the, the, these monies finally accumulated, uh, they used it to buy something real, commodities. Ambassador. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Okay. I think, thank you very much. Thanks for those questions and comments. I think the other two were comments. We take that on board. I think what I'm going to do now is, sorry, sorry, Ambassador Zula, I forgot about that one. Please, please. So that everyone can, can, can be able to, to, to see me. Um, thank you for, for that question. Look, we, we take our approach also from our own experience and the work that we've been doing. Not uh, today because we are, in, we are now involved. Uh, also from our own experience in the African continent. Try and imagine that there is a conflict, example, in the DRC. And then you decide, no, me, I'm going to be only with this one and I'm not going to talk to the others. Uh, how would you ever be able to bring these people to table and have a conversation when you immediately jump into, we are only supporting this one? The reason why we pursue the non-alignment, and again, the ambassador said it very clear that uh, they don't believe in that, and uh, he spoke to the issue, you are either with us or not with us. That concept is not ours. It belongs somewhere. The person that you indicated says you are either with us or not with us. We don't believe, we don't believe in that concept because if you use that concept in, in the current situation where we are trying to get everybody at table and have a conversation, we say we are non-aligned because we want to be trusted we want to be leaders. We want to go there with a sense of feeling that when we walk into the room, those people who are warning um, a, a factions, if I may call it that way, would look at us and say, when President Sil Ramaphosa walks in here, they will have a confidence that he's going to be able uh, to listen to both. And we're not uh, saying that it's not costly for us. When they say it's either with us or not with us, we know exactly what that's going to happen to us, particularly as a country. And we know what has happened to us with regard to supporting Palestine, with regard to supporting Venezuela, with regard to uh, supporting Cuba. We've gone through this pain. And even now, in order to get to peace, 
Many at times you will go through pain. Many at times you will go through sacrifice. But when all is said and done, it was also important for you to look at your national interests. How do you carry your own national interests? And our national interests for us are not narrowed down to just our national interests. The African continent is important to us because we can't be, as President Beggy used to say in the past, we can't be these people who are living well in a sea of poverty around us. And therefore the importance of talking to other leaders of the African continent to move with a common approach and a common understanding is very important. So that slogan, you are either with us or not with us, is not our concept. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for that. I think uh, our panelists have now been sitting here for some time. Uh, we are good. Yeah, no, don't worry, you can't complain. Everyone is freezing. Uh, and you are not special. <laughs> oh, you are higher up. Okay, I think we'll start with Clayson. Um, I'm going to give you uh, three minutes each. Yeah, 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 three minutes. Uh, you must be succinct and to the point. What do you think? Uh, uh, oh, okay. okay. Okay, five minutes each. Uh, I'm going to cut you off, unfortunately. Otherwise, we'll be here for a very long time. Please, you may commence. Well, good evening, um, Excellencies. Uh, uh, Secretary General and uh, the viewers at home. Um, five minutes is too short, but I'm going to try. I wanted to start with uh, uh, this question that was asked around the correctness of South Africa's position. Of uh, by the way, we we, we no longer just say non-aligned; we now say active non-alignment. Uh, we give meaning to the active part by the actions that we have taken as a country. One example being the Africa Peace Mission that has just returned from both Kiev and St. Petersburg. Um, if you want evidence of how correct this position is, it's the fact that President Zelensky was willing to receive the seven heads of state. Um, if we're taken a side uh, it would have been difficult to convince the two capitals to receive us. Um, in fact, I, those of you who are not on Twitter, please join Twitter and follow me. Uh, I retweeted a statement by the ambassador of Ukraine following that uh, peace mission uh, led by President Ramaphosa. And, and, and she said this. Uh, she said, we believe that South Africa is an important player on the African continent and the president, no, no, the presence of President Cyril Ramaphosa in Ukraine was meaningful to us. This is the ambassador of Ukraine. Following that statement, uh, our Director General Zain Dango and the National Security Advisor, Professor Mufamadi, have just returned from Copenhagen to be part of a conversation um, led by Ukraine, where they were presenting President Zelensky's peace plan. From the African continent, they invited South Africa. From the Global South, three strong democracies, South Africa, Brazil, and India. That tells you um, how critical South Africa is in being active uh, in our non-alignment position, because we are now part of efforts uh, to seek a solution to this ongoing war. Uh, I just wanted to make the point that we're not just not aligned, we're actually actively participating in efforts to seek a solution. So you may ask, from a South African point of view, uh, why is it important for South Africa to be part of this uh, efforts? Uh, why are we worried? Firstly, it was also very historic. You've never heard of African heads of state intervening in another region of the world, uh, in this case Europe, uh, to lead efforts to provide um, or seek a peaceful solution to a, a raging war. 
uh, and the previous speakers have correctly stated the genesis of this position adopted by the South African government. We believe that uh, political differences that lead to conflicts of this nature are best resolved through dialogue, through negotiations, uh, through diplomacy. Uh, that's how you provide a durable solution that can be owned by everyone. Um, and this is why we'll continue uh, with this position because we believe it's very correct. Uh, and of course, the impact of this war on African economies and the livelihoods of our people is evident. Other people have already <coughs> spoken to this. Uh, so we'll continue with that. Um, the last point I wanted to make was that um, even those who were critical, by the way, of South Africa's position couldn't tell you uh, what the alternative would have been. And we believe that South Africa's position is going to be vindicated because in the context of any war, the most powerful call you can make is for peace. How do you arrive at peace? You have to, at some point, uh, put the two sides together to negotiate a way out. Uh, war only brings destruction of infrastructure and property and the killing of people, innocent people at that. Last point. Non-alignment should never be confused with neutrality. We are not neutral. Yes. If you are neutral, you are oblivious to the suffering of people, uh, to what international law provides, to the UN Charter and its provisions. South Africa has never been neutral. Uh, we made a very deliberate and intentional decision based on our history. We, by the way, as a country, are not strangers uh, to peace building and peacemaking. If you look at our history, on the African continent, for example, look at DRC, Burundi, um, currently, or the latest one, Tigray, Ethiopia. In fact, in other regions of the world as well, President Ramaphosa, look at Ireland, uh, in Sri Lanka. So we have a history um, uh, of being part of efforts to bring about peace, and we believe we'll bring that experience to bear, even on the current conflict. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was 5 minutes 18 seconds. Well done. Oh, sir. I'm going to stand firstly because I'm short. I'm the flower. Okay, might, uh, might chow me from this, this particular group of, um, of audience members. Uh, let me start by appreciating the ANC um, and all those who came together to bring together this dialogue because we know there's been a lot that's been spoken about, not just in South African news, not just in African news, but all over the world. I'm a young person, so I'm going to say some very unpopular things. Try not to throw your water bottles at me. SG, try not to shout at me afterwards, but it's very important. Um, we as young people must speak the truth. Um, and we must hold up the mirror to society, and we must say what others are unafraid, or, or rather afraid to say. Um, and I think that's why it's quite important today that we say those things. We know that there's a huge crisis in the world. We've all heard about it. Uh, it's been all over the news, whether it's been fake news, true news, all of that stuff, it's bombarded. And I think we as young people are particularly, particularly susceptible to that because we always get that information first, whether it's on our smartphones, whether it's on social media, whether it's from TikTok. How many people saw TikToks um, of people who are either on one side or other side of the war? We've never seen that. Um, and it's something that we really need to come to terms with. But what's important? the holistic perspective on South Africa and on Africa as a whole. We're not looking at that. It's always from a Western perspective or a Russian perspective or a Ukrainian perspective. It's never reported from a South African and an African perspective. And I think that's the first major flaw in the discussion and that we as young people must champion. Because the reality is no one's going to push a decolonial agenda if we don't do it ourselves. And a decolonial agenda means, of course, we're not pro-West. I think we're all quite clear about that. But that doesn't mean we're pro-Russia as well. Two Amen. things can be true at the same time. Yes. I mean, this is not shocking. We can be anti-war. We can be anti one invading the sovereignty of another country. But that doesn't mean we agree with Western powers bullying us, um, not just as South Africans, not just as Africans, but as young people. And I think it's also important to note if we go outside and we speak to a random young person in South Africa, we'll ask them about the Russia-Ukraine war. In all likelihood, they are going to tell you, actually, I don't have a job, I don't have access to the economy, I don't have an opportunity in education, I don't have X, Y, Z. Why does this affect me? And that's important, fundamentally important, because that discussion is being left out completely. 
And that means, number one, young people are not having enough access to progressive internationalism. Why is it important? How does it affect us? This idea that we don't understand politics, it's nonsense. But the reality also is that we as young people are being left behind. Not just this in this discussion, but also in the economy. And that's something that we need to really fundamentally place in this discussion and what's been missing from it. I think someone asked the question about economic opportunities and really where the trade is. Unfortunately, South Africa's biggest trade partners are not BRICS or Russia. It's Germany, it's the US, it's the EU. Now we need to deeply reflect on that. Because what does it mean when we go back to young people and back to South Africans and we say the economy is going to be in an even more dire situation than before? Why is it important to us as young South Africans? But very importantly, major implications, the Russia-Ukraine war. So anyone who tells you I'm not too sure, I don't have a view, think about it because you need to have a view. Not only is it going to affect uh, the world balance of forces, but it also affects us as both the ANC and as a, as a government. There was a time in which the ANC-led government was the moral high ground on the global stand. Is that still the case now? And I say this, I said I was going to say unpopular things, but it's important to say it now. Do we still hold the gravitas that we did before? And we need to fight to ensure that we continue to do that. So we welcome the president and we welcome the interventions of other African leaders to, pr to produce a negotiated settlement or a negotiated way out of the conflict. Being anti-war is not an unpopular view. We should be anti-war. When war happens, who gets harmed the most? It's the poor, it's the working class, it's young people, it's the marginalized, it's the LGBTQIA plus community, it's the elderly. And that's been left out of the conversation every single time. So I think it's very important that we keep that there. I think it's very important that we center that discussion. But very importantly, and I think it must be noted, that the African leaders and the African delegation are amongst the only in the world who could have a morning meeting with President Zelensky, and proverbially speaking, an afternoon meeting with President Putin. And therefore, there is a huge, huge power of African leaders that is being undermined by the global forces and the Western powers as well. Thinking, oh, who are these African leaders to go in? Actually, we're probably the only ones who can. And we're the only ones who can go from both sides and say, actually, what's happening really very much is a crisis. Young people in particular, and I will always, always mention this, are the ones who are continuously um, at the back foot. And let me say one last thing, Program Director, because I think it's very, very important that we do it. We as South Africans, and let me make it very clear, and we as South African young people, we're not going to be used as fodder for a particular battle that never has our interest or doesn't center us, both as young people and as South Africans, um, in, terms of the, in terms of the discussion. So we're not going to be anyone's sacrificial lambs in their fight for global dominance. We will decide as young people and as South Africans what our outcomes are going to be and how it's going to affect the economy. So this idea that we're being shoved along, whether we left or right, nobody, nobody is fighting for the interests of this country and nobody is fighting for the interests of young people in the marginalized. And that's something that we really need to put onto the agenda. So program director, what is important is that we fight for South Africans to have autonomy, for us to self-determine and for us to decide what we're going to do. And I think very much the South African delegation that went to Ukraine and Russia and the African delegation has fought for that. And that's something that we really need to center. So apart from what I've said, it's very important that we as young people force our way back into the agenda and we force the discussion to be centered around us because nobody will. Thank you very much. Uh, SG, is there you witness firsthand the vibrancy of the young people? <laughs> um, thank you very much for those, for those uh, and reminding us what is important. Uh, Professor Landsberg, over to you. Thank you. Do you mind if I stand at the the, the, the reason why I decided to stand at the podium, it's the closest SG that I'll ever come to power. <laughs> <laughs> So, let me uh, use my five minutes and three constructively. 
Let me deal with the five provocations in very succinct uh, terms, and hopefully I can expand on a few of them. Non-alignment is it outdated. Non-alignment has never been outdated. We have allowed non-alignment. We have allowed non-alignment to lie dormant and resurrect it when it becomes necessary. If you go to 1955 in Bandung and all those progressive principles laid out by the members of the non-aligned movement, non-aggression, and it didn't say we will not choose, um, uh, we, we won't get involved in conflicts between great powers, specifically said we will not be allowed to choose between the wars of great powers. On the contrary, we will intercede and try and make the case against it. Non-alignment has always been relevant. We, including the African National Congress government, allowed it to lie dormant. Let me ask a, and excuse the gendered language, let me ask a pregnant question in terms of the revival of our monoline. Did we give President Zelensky enough time before the Lady Arsan? Did we reach out to Ukraine as much as we did to the Russians? Or did we do it only after the rogue, rogue actions of an American ambassador? That was rogue at, at a high level for the ambassador to do that. Almost as rogue as what the Poles did at the airport at Warsaw. That was rogue. You don't go and brandish the weaponry of a head of state um, to show what that head of state. You really put that head of state. So, I hope I've answered the first question. But I want to add two points to non-alignment. I wish to introduce two new forms or variants of non-alignment that we should seriously consider. A more progressive non-alignment, the non-alignment that continue to ask for equitability in the world. Because in this geopolitical warfare that's going on, it is stated in America's documents it is an hegem it's a hegemonic project and i'm willing to say in front of the russian ambassador the miscalculation probably was that the war wouldn't last that long but now that it's lasted that long the project is no longer just to restore on alignment the sovereignty of ukraine it has now become regime change in Russia, and even the westernization of Russia, and it will not end with Russia. The West goes to Hiroshima, they declare China enemy number one. Two weeks later, Secretary of State Blinken goes to China, say let's cool it off. Three days later, President Biden calls President Xi Jinping a dictator, and we back to it. To where we were. America's project is to push the hegemony envelope about that we should have no illusions. And there are dire consequences for South Africa. The adage of America's foreign policy, my enemy's friend is my enemy. We have become, as I've written, a frenemy state of America. And I think America is sharpening their swords for South Africa. Second point, the UN Charter. We all agree, even the Americans agree, we should live by the principles of the UN Charter. Here is the problem. America has a particular doctrine towards multilateralism. Multilateral if we can. Unilateral if we have to. Let's, let's be specific. We knew if we, if we took the case of President um, Putin to the ICC, 
the Norwegian ambassador will agree. It would have been vetoed at the United Nations Security Council. So what do we do? We get the prosecutor to ask the judges to issue a warrant of arrest. Because if we take it to the United Nations, it will be defeated right there on the spot. Question, why shouldn't other countries do the same? Just a bit of statistics. Since 1989, America has gone to 19 wars of its own choice. 1919. Russia, four. China, zero. No. China has never used its military to invade another country. America, 19 times. I wish we could have spoken up. And America's smaller NATO members could have spoken out when the United Nations was outsourced for a NATO operation against Libya, which today is a shadow of its former self. She does inequality in world affairs based on might is right, uh, is one that should be challenged. You ask the fascinating question. Is America's hegemony under threat? Two points. America's hegemony is definitely under threat. But I have no illusions. For those of you who sit here and think that America is going to sit idly by and see its hegemony waning, um, think, think again. America is going to fight. The Biden legacy that he's fighting for is not only to secure the survival of the Western liberal order, and therefore the perpetuation of Western Germany, but it's to expand Germany. The problem with the Americans, if they think it's going to remain a uni, multipolar world, they live in a in cloud cuckoo land. BRICS is the reality. And at least for one country in BRICS, it is not just a countervailing force to American hegemony. That's China, of course. It is a potential alternative um, to BRICS. So I end by just invoking these two new forms of um, hegemony. I spoke about the progressive one. But I think where South Africa really went wrong in conclusion, um, Chair, is we've lost our way in multi-stakeholder power balancing and managing the relations between great powers. There was a time when having relations with China, Russia, and China, sorry, and Russia and America actually gave us stature in the world. Why did we allow it to become a problem? Was it really worth it for a controversy over one ship and one aeroplane to, to bring us to a point, the, inco un, the, the, the inconceivable point that 30 years later was the last time we received sanctions, 1986, the Comprehensive Anti-Apartheid Act. Are we really back there? where this country, 30 years later after its settlement, will again be slapped with sanctions? Man, it's inconceivable. Thank you very much.
the conference that took place now in support of Ukraine, all of those things, including the African mission in his own context. Very interesting listening to him. If you can go back to that thing to understand what that man was saying, then you know what games are being played here. There is no station that I listen to. Even yesterday, I went through all of them as usual. Because I have that last one. <laughs> the last ones I listened to with the locals and I switched off. Immediately I started exploring. Because I have a problem. And maybe it's a problem we need to discuss at some particular point. How the tools becomes a casualty. If you are not original in our thinking and interrogation of processes. Two, consistency and continuity is very important. World War One, World War Two. You look at the history and the positions that were taken by the ANC. Not different from today. Same. Different context. <coughs> when those who declared victory against Nazism and forgetting that we are also there, that's why we are celebrating Mayendi. Because we are part of that process. We're fighting because there was an unjust war that had to be fought. That is a basis on which the ANC was mobilizing our people. That's the truth. That is history. When there was a gathering to look at the formation of the United Nations, and the Atlantic Charter was being discussed with Jan Smarts, the one the street is named after. Being there, representing South Africa, white apartheid South Africa. But not called apartheid then. Was there, Jan Smarts? President Kuma convened a meeting of ANC intellectuals and academics and came up with the African claims to say we also have claims about what should happen. We did. Even the Bill of Rights, the ANC, before even the UN adopted the Bill of Rights, we had. We are far ahead of our time, maybe. So we are very consistent with some of these things. We don't need to be taught lessons. Our history itself is a lesson. If we reflect on it, that's where our pride comes from. I think the question of non alignment was. Well argued. You know, when Tassi Sul and Asmek have tried, I went to the Bandung Conference. And everything that followed, and the principles, and when we joined the UN and became part of the non alignment movement, which you hosted here and did all sorts of things, was still part of it. There is a difference in terms of that movement and the anti war stance that we adopted when a non-binding resolution was being pushed down our throats with the abuse of the national, of the, the, the General Assembly of the United Nations. When they said take sides, we said no. We refused. And that's the principle on the basis of which we invoke the non-aligned principle. It's different from talking about the non aligned movement. It will wake up. It will be revived because the circumstances dictate so. War? No, we don't want it. We want to war. By the way, now in winter in Europe, which is some of the things that we're not saying yet, the people of Europe were out in the street demonstrating against the war because they were freezing. No gas, no nothing, because of the sanctions that have been adopted against us. They were freezing. They were in the streets. The anti-war movement was being rekindled. It's there. We know it because of the time of the anti-apartheid movement. That the governments that were supporting the apartheid move, uh, government here in this country did not represent their people. 
the governments today that are saying they are for democracy, the very governments that even cannot include Ukraine as a member of the EU or NATO because of its democratic deficiencies. So what they say, they can't qualify. And these are the people who are advancing democracy. We have to be told, we need to be told the truth. What exactly is this confusion in Europe? I think Europe is confused. We are tired of this European confusion. <laughs> and once we take our own position to go to you and tell you what we think must be done and where you are going wrong. And, and all of these things must come to an end. I want to come to the question of the UN Charter. <clears throat> the first sentence of the UN Charter says, we, the people of the United Nations, not the governments of the United Nations, P5 or P3 or whatever, doesn't say we, the people of the United Nations. That's what the UN Charter says. We are the people. When all these decisions are being taken, where are they? It's because of abuse of trust by some governments, because of the power politics that is being played in the UN, that we find ourselves in the situation in which we are in today. Now there's a decision that is being taken by a pen holder of the resolution in, 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 in Mali that by the end of this month, that peacekeeping mission must come to a close. It's come to an end. And others are beginning to say what will happen. Because if that happens, it means the Wagner Group is going to be destroying everything that the UN was preserving in that country. And we know who money has kicked out. And they still continue to say, those are the pain holders. Now, let, let's not make, uh, you know, there's a game I used to play as a child called Snakes and Letters. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to go back there. <laughs> and I won't even buy it for my grandchildren. Right? It's a waste of time. <laughs> can't go back. Don't take us there. So at the end of the day, all who are saying that this war must end, must end. And the agreements that are going to be made, that continue to be made, must be respected. The means agreements, uh, uh, I think, are dated also like the nano line. So every agreement becomes a, a data if it is not important. Some of us who are active, we know what the Cold War is all about. We are active. The anti-war movement in the youth and student movement we know the Cold War and the positions that we were forced to take, and even the anti-war movement and all of those things, we want our children and our grandchildren not to find themselves in the same situation. Our liberation was delayed because of that. We were affected because of that. The silence of the conflict impacted negatively on us. Many other situations, so please, don't give us lessons about the history that we have lived through. Don't. Respect the fact that we can think we have had this experience and this is our lesson. By the way, if you think that the ANC is bankrupt in terms of thinking, go back to its history. Go back to its history. It was too ahead of its time being. And even now, we might be ahead of our time in terms of what we are saying to you. And it's a good thing that after Moscow and Kiev, all of you are coming back to understand from us what are they saying. Keep it up. <laughs>
Now, before I go to questions. Thank you very much for the indulgence, Chair. Uh, oh, I'm being told I must stand. Um, no, in a summarized version, uh, just to say that uh, the independent inquiry um, that the President has instituted, led by a retired judge on the matter of Lady R, is working, is currently doing its work. We've made the call, by the way, previously, that anybody that has evidence, including those who are making noises, must come. Can I tell you, to date, zero has been provided to the independent inquiry. Number two, the National Arms Control Committee is on record as saying there was never a decision by the South African government to sell arms uh, to Russia. The ambassador of Russia is here. If we had sold anything to them, I'm sure he would confirm. Nothing was sold to them, at least by the government. Um, these matters were explained to the Pentagon, the White House, and the State Department. So they know. We've shared with them information at our disposal. So there's no confusion from their part, which is why we agree with you that ambassador went rogue. And this is why he apologized. I was in the meeting when we demarched him, and he did apologize unreservedly. Thirdly, to say that we don't think there is a contradiction or we've been unable to manage relations between the US, China, and Russia from where we stand. And this notion or narrative that there's a threat of sanctions against South Africa, we don't know where it comes from. From the conversations we've had with the US and all the key decision makers, there's no such. Uh, President sent special envoys to the, to the United States, as you know, and they had conversations with everyone. And uh, as far as we are concerned, they know such a threat. I'm glad the media is covering this conversation. Please kill that narrative. There is no threat of sanctions against South Africa on this file. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Let's have questions, clarifications. One, here in front. Two, three. Four, five. Let's have those five, and then we see how we go. No, no, we'll take those five first. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Program Director. I'm Lucy Cook. I am South Africa's Ambassador at Large for Peace and Security. I'm responding to several elements. Something that has been mentioned that South Africa is losing its stature on the global scene. I think Ambassador Tapo said, unless you are inside a process, you cannot say definitively that a country has lost stature or no. Jason, my colleague, has addressed the issue of uh, sanctions. Ambassador Ntlapo again also talks about the people, we the people. When you look at the resolutions that have been passed on Ukraine, all of them, when you take all of the countries that voted, yes, they carry, the total populations that they carry combined is between 27% and 30%, never above 45% of the global world. So in this contest, we still need to find a way in which we establish what the citizens of the world want with respect to uh, Ukraine. I love when the ambassador of Norway said, our colonizers, former colonial powers have reformed, more or less like telling us that alcoholics have recovered by self-proclamation without any evidence. We don't see that evidence. It has as yet to be established. Uh, to us because we see relapses in conduct uh, that uh, exhibit predatory a uh, predatory nature you know beneath every conflict you have in, in the continent I don't rule out the end of our former one or other of our former colonizers that right in there not just fighting to retain control of the processes in the continent but also to be able to retain dominance 
on key issues such as mineral resources in the continent. Yeah. But for me, if Europe is going to say to us, pick a side, I would want to know what for, how is this going to end? What am I buying into? What am I giving you a blank check for? You haven't told us how this ends. You've not told us. Is the expectation that you're going to kill Russia out of existence and then it ends? No. You're not going to be able to do that. But you owe us a vision of peace after Ukraine because something has been broken. This is what I've been saying to my counterparts when I meet them. What are we signing on to? Something has been ruptured in Ukraine. What we had pre-Ukraine in terms of what is holding global peace is gone. Now, if Europe wants us to be on their side, what is it that Europe is offering us? So far as I know, the African leaders are the only leaders from a region, the only region. Africa is the only region that went to Ukraine. Not to beg, as the president was explaining in Paris, to say we have a right to peace. We demand to have a say in it. It's interesting how people have sought to belittle this, 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 this initiative and, and, and to cast out on it as if African leaders can never succeed. And as South Africa's record of mediation stretches as far as Colombia, uh, Ireland and everything. But if South Africa is going to pick a side, what is it that we will be picking a side for? Because, because even the democracy that you talk about, the vision we see in Europe of democracy has changed completely. In the constitution of South Africa, I don't want you to answer, Ambassador, I want you to mark it over. <laughs> in the vision, in the vision, sorry, of democracy that South Africa, that is embodied in the constitution, is non-racism. Yet South Africa and Europe do not meet. We have a challenge with racism in Europe. Europe doesn't want to confront racism, consistently votes against and pushes the back programs on racism in the UN system. Europe, Europe. The United States also has issues with this. But when you have in the United States of America an erosion of democracy that challenges the International Convention on the Civil and Political Rights, the right to vote, you have politicians actively and in public putting in place measure, measures to disenfranchise people on the basis of race. Okay. Is that the democracy that we're buying into? No, it's not the democracy that is envisaged in our constitution. Now, the media, our media, there's a lot of noise for us practitioners. Sometimes we have to ignore it. We don't know what is it that they're saying. But it has to do also with narratives, the creation of narratives. We ought to be discerning about the narratives that are being created. But nobody has told us how this ends. We have a right to know how it ends. We have a right to shape how it ends. We can't give anyone a blank check. That is how I understand our plan alignment. Thank you. <laughs> Number two. Thank you. From Johannesburg, RDC member, convener of International Relations Subcommittee. Mine is to say the stance that we took as African National Congress, it's correct to talk about peace. One, we have learned around the wars in Africa that they disrupt. And who are the most affected people? It will be women and children because they are displaced. The people living with disability. The current stance we are saying, it should continue on a peace mission. Because if you talk about peace, you talk about love also. That you need to harness the things that you love mostly. Because without peace, you cannot talk about love. So the African National Congress, it was built on a relationship of ensuring that there's unity in the world. And we share also on the resources. Because without sharing those resources, 
that's where will not have peace, will continue to have these wars. Some of the wars are unnecessary. So we are saying we'll continue as per our resolutions to build peace in Africa and in the world. Thank you. Thank you. Number three. Do we have a mic there? Thanks. Dumelam uh, Bagaitu. My name is Topo Matlape from Botswana. Uh, as Dada Sererud uh, have said, I'm one of the migrants who came to add some value into South Africa. Um, but mine is very, it's a very simple one. Two is two things. One is a statement and the second one is a question to me, Zulu or Re Clayton. 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 My apology. One, the first statement is, uh, you know, in Setswana we say uh, we believe that you know, war does not bring any peace, whether we like it or not. And provocation by NATO and America, by adding more and more military equipment into Ukraine will make it even worse. And it, there will never be peace anytime soon. We can guarantee, I think let's all agree to that. As long as these things are happening, there will never be peace anytime soon. So number two is the question. When South Africa sneezes, the rest of South Africa catches the cold. Um, so what has been happening is that, for example, I, I'm in the business of retail. We buy commodities and, and products from South Africa. And uh, since the war started, I, we were happy that COVID was, you know, the COVID thing was coming to an end, even though COVID is not over, but it was coming to an end. But when it, when it ended, then this war thing came. And when it came, it came with consequences. And one of those consequences is the cost of doing business. And for us, because uh, in our business, 90% of our products, we source them from South Africa. Uh, and, and ever since the war started, the price of commodities, things like uh, oil, things like uh, wheat flour, things like uh, fuel, those things, the cost just kept going up and up and up. And it's not only Botswana, it's also countries like Zambia, Zimbabwe, you know, the Sadek region, basically. You know. So some, some of the feeling and sentiments we had was that, you know, we feel like South Africa has not done enough, you know, to curb such consequences. Uh, you know, the question I would ask is, is it difficult, or was it difficult, for South Africa to source directly from Russia? Uh, because we understand, for example, India had a, 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 an agreement with Russia to buy fuel from them directly at a certain discounted price. Was it difficult? Because if you think about it, fuel is the, is the, most, is the major driver of inflation and is the major driver of economic sabotage. Was it difficult for South Africa to say, Russia, can you supply us with oil? at a discounted price so that we establish the rest of the region, not only South Africa, but the rest of the Sadek region, so that there is economic growth as well in those areas. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Number four. Uh, thank you, Program Director. My name is Rudy Peterson. I'm from the uh, University of Johannesburg as well. Uh, in, indeed, I think uh, we've witnessed the air I must uh, say to the ambassador on the stage, the ANC is still the powerhouse of a contestation of ideas, just as the role of universities. I think what we've heard here is a very engaging contestation of ideas, and I think we are all enriched. Uh, I think the ambassador there sent us a strong message. There may be turbulence in the ruling party, but... Uh, it, there is no bankruptcy of ideas. And I, I think that's, that is a profound point. Yes, indeed, I think in the ANC there is a downside. Uh, I think as South Africans, the one thing I want to mention, and I say that all in my uh, consultancy work, South Africans, we are very brilliant and good at planning and policy development, but we are the worst in implementation. 
And I think the problem that we as a nation, even in foreign diplomacy, have today is because of that lack of implementation. Many of the things that has been said here today have been said. Many policies have been developed, but the implementation has been bad. Not only in international relations, social development, economic development. We as a nation seem to recycle many policy initiatives. If you look down in the history of government here, I mean, 23 years into democracy, but there has been duplication uh, in terms of many of our policy development. I think this, to me, has been uh, diplomacy at work, as, as illustrated uh, by uh, the, uh, the strong views of the ambassador from uh, Norway, and I want to challenge the ambassador from Norway with a question, and I'll end off there. Though me and him agree, I'm an ardent uh, Arsenal supporter, so Odegaard, Haaland, and Angelina Jolly, Angel Angelina Jordan, I'm vehement followers of them. But I must say, ambassador, I would disagree with you partially. So we agree on that one, but we agree, disagree on something else. I think the minister said it. So I want to leave you, it seems, it seems the ambassador is leaning, has got a bias, a bias towards uh, the U Ukraine as a nation. He mentioned the exploitation, <clears throat> he mentioned that uh, uh, this, this Russian war is, is, is not as a result of anything but uh, the Russian situation, the Russian pushing the agenda. He has not mentioned anything of the exploitation of the West, particularly NATO. Does he not believe that NATO expansion has anything to do with the conflict? Thank you. Thank you. Number five. Good evening. My name is uh, Romain Johnson from Radio France. I have no comments to make but questions. Uh, first for Lindy Wezulu. Uh, the Russian ambassador said that the Bucha massacre was a setup. Uh, we know that the president Ramaphosa visited Bucha. Uh, do you think that Bucha was a setup? Do you think that uh, dead bodies, the dead bodies were fake? Uh, a question to Clayson. The Russian ambassador said that uh, it's not a war between Russia and Ukraine, but a war of the collective West against Russia. Does DIRCO, does the government agree with this point of view? Last question. Who among the panel thinks that NATO is responsible for the war? Who, um, who among the panelists believe that NATO is responsible for this war? Yeah. Thank you very much. Can we have the last one before we go back to the panelists here? Thank you. You are okay. Okay. You are fine. I'm on my feet. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Chair. My question basically is based on the Norwegian Embassy. When our leader in Africa go to Ukraine and Russia to seek peace, and you still insist on saying that you will support Kiev with weapons, do are you praising for war until when? Because every day what we are, are seeing, it's people dying. So I believe that at the end of the day, the whole uh, resolution which was taken by ANC for international relations, peace and stability. That is what we must enforce. Thank you. Yeah, you can give the mic to that gentleman. Oh, you've got a mic. Yeah, please go. Uh, good evening all. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I've got uh, just one or two comments. Uh, when BRICS was formed, did it uh, give uh, 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 a relative charge that we are pro-Russia and anti-West. 
because I believe as pro-Africans, we have the right for associating ourselves with a better future. And uh, when the Russian war started, when the Russian war started with Ukraine, the first thing that happened was more an attack on, you, you know, the economic status. Like, uh, uh, if you look at how the West related to Russia, was let's block them in the banking world. Let's take them out of sports. Nothing relative to end uh, the, the, the status of how war could influence uh, the whole package. If, if, we, if we look at the BRICS nations, I think it's almost 42% of the world population that's in BRICS now, as we speak. So if BRICS must decide now to say, listen, we are coming together as an anti-Western force, how will that relate? Because uh, we have FIFA on the one side, we have BRICS on the other side. We have uh, a financial organ in, in BRICS and we uh, put up a fight against uh, Visa, Master, uh, and American Express, or SWIFT, right? We, we need to, 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 to come to a point where we are saying we need to influence the world by saying, if we have a problem, right? Europe cannot associate it with the fact that we are now anti-Ukraine because we have joined BRICS. And Russia cannot assume that we are pro-Russia because we are in BRICS. Okay. We, we, need, we need to make a, a yeah. clear decision. Just give the mic to the lady at the back there. That's the last person. Thank you so much. So, Fim Kone from the SAPC. I just want to correct the ambassador um, who said uh, the South African media, uh, we are lost, we are not. Uh, we have been reporting the story in a very balanced manner. I can say it on behalf of SAPC. That is why even many, many influential newsmakers in South Africa have been on SAPC putting their views across, including the ambassador of Ukraine and the ambassador of Russia. And I've seen many analysts here who have been on SABC arguing their case. And also, we bring you live, live, not recorded visuals when some of these incidents are happening. When the president was in Ukraine, we were there, even though some journalists were grounded. When the president was in St. Petersburg, we were there, live, even though journalists couldn't go there. My only question to everybody in the house, where to from here, in relation to ensuring that this war does come to an end, particularly the ambassador of Norway, okay. who is part of NATO, and the ambassador of Russia, where yeah. to from here? Yeah, okay, thank you, Sophie. Uh, colleagues, I know this is, one, this is one of those times where you are now at a moment where everyone wants to say something and respond because emotions are high, everyone has a, a view to share. But I'm still going to moderate. Okay? So, um, I want, Clayson, if you can respond to whether the government's position is that this is Russia versus the collective West. That's your question. Um, I, don't, I don't know if you want to touch on the butcher massacre. If you want to, you can. Uh, Chris, I want you to respond to the BRICS issue and the duality that was asked. Um, the weaponization of certain international systems. Uh, do you understand? Yes. Yeah. Oh, you want to respond also to that one? Okay. Those, yeah, who caused the war? That's right. And then um, I'm going to ask literally 
One minute. No, that's perhaps unreasonable. Two minutes for the ambassador of Norway to respond. Um, but I'm really going to hold you to two minutes because I know we can discuss and debate and go on and on on issues. And then similarly, uh, the Russian ambassador, you have two minutes. And then we are going to conclude. And uh, Comrade Secretary General, uh, just to prepare yourself, after that, I'm going to call on you to, to please come to the podium. Okay, Clayson. Thank you very much, uh, 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 Dr. Van Heerden. Well, you know, so the ambassador of Russia makes a statement and Radio France International says I must respond to that. So if I told you now that Kaiser Chiefs is the best team in South Africa, that would be my view. The prof here may disagree because he may think that it's... Uh, okay. So, so um, Tada uh, may disagree because he thinks it's pirates. Of course, he would be wrong, but that he would be entitled to that view. Um, where to from here? So, South Africa is going to be participating in the Russia-Africa summit. The expectation is that uh, the seven heads of state... Sabotage. Uh, so the expectation is that the seven heads of state who are part of the Africa Peace Mission will utilize that occasion uh, to continue to engage because peace building and peacemaking is not an event but a process. We have started the process of South Africa and uh, we are intentional in uh, continuing with, with this process because we think the war must end. Uh, because of the implications that everybody has spoken about. President Zelensky has proposed the idea of a Ukraine-Africa engagement as well. Of course, one of the options would be that in the mid-year summit of the Africa, uh, African Union, he may be invited to come and address the African Union. That's one of the options that's being explored. Um, the seven heads of state have agreed in principle that there must be a platform for Ukraine to also engage with the continent in the manner that Russia is going to engage with the continent as part of the Russia-Africa summit. Uh, so South Africa is determined to continue with this process because we think that uh, we have to do everything possible uh, to bring peace uh, to bear. Uh, I just wanted to end with this uh, moderator that, you know, the historic nature of this intervention by Africa, uh, led by the seven heads of state, was such that uh, there were moves to try and sabotage it. On the eve of the uh, departure of the heads of state uh, to Kiev, I get a call from one global media house that says to me, so are you working on new dates for this thing? Because obviously it can't continue. So I'm like, why? No, don't you know? Three heads of state have pulled out. So obviously it won't continue. So I said to him, I'm about to issue a statement confirming that President Ramaphosa and others are going. Uh, so these interventions of yours that you're familiar with to try and sabotage this thing won't work. So that's how historic this intervention was. They were moved to try and stop it or at least sabotage it. There are other panel members um, as well that I think should come in. So let me respond to the, to the two questions that I was asked to respond to. But I want to say something about the R chair with your permission. But let, me, let, let me respond to the French journalists. I, I, I don't have a yellow card in my pocket. I don't have a membership to government or any foreign so I speak as a loyal cater of the University of Johannesburg. <laughs> I put it to you that on several occasions in the last 30 years that NATO was a direct threat to international peace and security. I come back to 2011. A no-fly zone is declared 
over Libya. America and your country go and awash Libya with weapons. Almost 12 years later, it's a destabilized, utterly destabilized country without a government. Your direct question. That's actually a nice short quote. NATO triggered the war, but as an Putin started the war. I want to go on record and say right in front of the Russian ambassador, those five stages of expansion that President Putin has been warning since 2001, NATO turned a blind eye. This war was indeed, Ambassador, you are correct, inevitable. If you pose a, an existential threat to a state, don't be surprised that that state is willing to pay the ultimate price in international relations by going to war. I want to go a step further in conclusion. I think we're now beyond NATO pushing to the frontiers of Russia. The project has now become regime change in Russia in order to make Russia a part of the West. And how do you do it? You trigger internal revolt and you exploit the resentment of the people to bring about a, re a revolt. Clayson, I want to say to you, you and I have had many, many early Saturday mornings, exchanges, on this matter. I don't want to put words in your mouth. Clayson said, up to now, SG, no evidence has come forward. You then made a very important statement, Clayson, to say, according to the conventional arms, the arms, con the conventional arms con uh, control co committee, um, no evidence of a license, and I have no reason to dispute that. What has not been said, and I don't want to speculate, is whether something did some, something untoward without government's permission. But we will wait for the outcome. Here is the question, Clayson. If it turns out that this report finds that an ambassador who went on record and say he's willing to pay with his life that there were arms uh, given to Russia. If it turns out that that is true, then I'm making a prediction, SG, that the fallout between South Africa and America will become greater because then America has some serious explanation to do to this republic, including who gave you the information? Did you do espionage on this country? Or do you do typical intelligence through the channels that should be? How did you go about getting intelligence which turned out to be wrong? I just want to say that, that the implications could be serious. And finally, Chair, yes, America is more worried about BRICS today, particularly dollar, dollarization, and that is for America a greater threat to BRICS's formation than any other issue on the BRICS agenda. Thanks. It's a, it's a bit awkward sitting in between these two guys. Uh, quick, quick things that I think are very important, right? Some of those questions triggered some, some thinking. The first thing is, it's fascinating, the double standards, and I think it must be said every time we talk about this issue. Um, when we call for boycott, divestment, and sanctions against apartheid Israel, we have been told time and time again it is not possible, so-and-so things will collapse, etc., etc. And yet, when this situation happened, 
the kind of moves, and I think one of our speakers, um, audience members spoke to it, the kind of moves, even in the financial sector, that move so fast, I think within a few days, um, the SWIFT system and a number of them actually just, they closed it off. So it's very, very clear what the agenda is. I think we're all very o open and honest about that. Um, but let's also be open and honest, right? I think we are very, very open in saying we disagree with the invading of a sovereign territory. Um, we can disagree with Russia for doing that, right? It's fundamentally something we are against. Um, at the same time, that doesn't mean that we don't acknowledge that NATO most certainly triggered, I like that word of triggered, um, the situation that we're in now. Um, and that doesn't mean that we as South Africa are running away from the conversation. We as South Africa are amongst the few in the world who are actually saying what we think to be true. Um, when so many countries are afraid of the repercussions of the West. And my last point, very last point, Program Director, you know, we're young people. We, ha we haven't lived through World War I or World War II. We've watched it, we've read about it in the history books, we've watched it in documentaries, and it's almost as if we learned nothing. And I say that as somebody who's not lived through a war. It's almost as if we want history to repeat itself. Um, and we as young people, again, must put it on record that we disagree and that we will fight for our autonomy to make those decisions and to prevent the end um, or, or rather the start of what could be a very devastating um, world war that will ultimately harm young people in particular and the most marginalized. 30 seconds, one assurance, Prof. Our intelligence community is very good. Uh, recently, that country said there was going to be a terrorist attack in Santon. Our intelligence committee said nothing of that sort is going to happen, and nothing happened. Quite right. On this Lady R file, we've engaged with our intelligence community. They've assured us that uh, what we are saying in public is correct. If anybody has evidence, they would have produced it by now. By the way, if anybody had done something there, one, it would be a criminal offense, the inquiry will produce and unmask that person, and that person will be prosecuted. It wouldn't have been the government of South Africa, and therefore no sanctions can come. Thank you. Ambassador? Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, again, a great debate. Uh, the many questions. Thank you so much. Uh, first of all, Norway very much welcome the African Peace Initiative, and I think it's uh, great that uh, you have a high-level African delegations going to Europe to try to promote peace. I think that's very great. As the United Nations Secretary General said, and uh, as I also think that uh, South Africa agree very much, uh, the UN Charter must be the basis for peace, and that means the territorial integrity of Ukraine must be kept. That's a key principle. That brings me to uh, your, spe your um, question about what's your interest. Well, more than 140 countries voted to condemn Russia's invasion in the United General Assembly. And I think the main driver was their own national interest, because if we allow big countries to take pieces of small countries at will, it's a risk for all countries. And that's what we in Europe feel is a big danger. If they get away with taking part of Ukraine, which European country is next? So I don't think actually Europe is confused. I think we are very united. And just as we have worked together on conflicts on the African continent, I think we all know how important it is to listen to the people that are close to the conflict. And that also goes for everyone on the African continent. You have to listen, first of all, to the Ukrainians, who are the victims. It's not like you have two sides in a civil war. Nobody invaded Russia. Nobody crossed the border into Russia. Russia chose to invade Ukraine. That's a fact, and they did it twice. So it's not like there is an equal equal uh, bad guys. There is one aggressor and there is one victim. And that must be the basis for peace. And Ukraine, they will be the one that determines the peace. They have their own peace plan. Uh, we support that. We support the African Peace Initiative. But uh, Russia chose war. And then we chose to support Ukraine's independence and right to self-determination. And we will do that as long as it takes. Thank A you. lot of been, uh, things have been said about the U.S. But before you talk about the U.S., look, look at what is wrong and what is right. Is it right that a big country can take a piece of a small country? Is that the world you want to live in? For Norway, the answer is clear. No, we are finished with that. Thank you. Yeah. Ambassador? Yeah. Mm. Uh, sorry, Ambassador, if you... Ambassador, can you please give the mic to the Ambassador? Thank you. This is a very symbolic gesture, yes. Thank you. 
I hope you will not regret it. <laughs> okay, uh, well, um, th there is a number of issues that I would like to respond to. First of all, about uh, peace and, and uh, invasion and aggression and so on and so forth. Uh, let me remind you that all diplomatic measures, to our mind, uh, were exhausted before we uh, did what we did, uh, before uh, Russian troops entered Ukraine. Uh, let me remind you, Radio France Internationale in particular, that uh, people who negotiated the Minsk agreements in 2015, including French President François Hollande, but also uh, Chancellor Angela Merkel and President Putin and President Lukashenko and the then President of Ukraine, Poroshenko, they negotiate. You can perhaps remember this dramatic uh, footage when presidents remained th throughout the night and negotiated themselves the agreements between Ukraine on the one side and Donetsk and Lugansk People's Republics on the other. Uh -huh. okay. <laughs> Uh, and and uh, then uh, the three presidents, Olan, well, uh, Ch Chancellor Merkel as well, and Poroshenko, in uh, the time span of two or three months, confirmed what we knew, we Russians knew, but what the world didn't know at that time, and perhaps most of the people do not know still, that Minsk agreements were there only to give some time for Ukrainian military to strengthen. And then there were uh, draft agreements that we circulated in, the gen in uh, December 2021 that would take care of our security concerns, part of which, only part of which is Ukraine. And then there was a letter by Minister Lavrov to his counterparts in the Western world about this principle of uh, equal and indivisible security in Europe which was negotiated for about a decade in the OSCE and then just brushed aside by, by uh, ministers of foreign affairs in the EU and so on. So I can continue. Yeah, but uh, another topic is um, to, 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 to the Norwegian colleague. I never said, I never insisted that you wrote a piece that uh, so shamelessly, as I said, uh, exposed uh, these, the repeated uh, this lie about Russian military using sexual violence as, uh, means, as a means of warfare. You did it. You signed. Yes. Thank you. Th thank you. Good. Uh, I, I'm glad we're clear here. And then uh, yet another uh, uh, subject matter about the African uh, mediation mission. Uh, I wasn't asked about it, but I should say that, that we welcome the effort. Uh, you, you, you saw how cordially and in a friendly atmosphere went the negotiations in St. Petersburg. Now my colleague and friend, Clayson Maniela, cited a uh, uh, Ukrainian ambassador about that, but there is another quotation. I mean, there, is, there should not be hyperinflated expectations because this, this is a Herculean task, in fact. And the problem will be on the Ukrainian side because they are not allowed by their patrons uh, to negotiate with us. We already have been just that close uh, from the peace agreement in uh, early, late in March, early April 2022, last year. And then uh, all of a sudden Ukrainian delegation in the afternoon simply left the scene left Istanbul, it was there with the mediation of Turkey. And since then, there was a number of gestures that were specifically designed, intentionally uh, executed to, to, uh, to uh, not to allow the talks uh, between our two countries. In particular, presidential decree by Zelensky in uh, September last year, which prohibits Ukrainian officials to have negotiations with the Russian officials. Thank you. And uh, one last thing, I'm sorry, but I would like to read this about the, you know, this mission. Um, and I quote Zelensky's advisor, Padalyaka, which, who said, African leaders had neither the capability nor the power to get involved in matters they knew nothing about. 
This was beyond their understanding. I will leave you with that. It's Thank food you. for thought. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to now take this opportunity. Thank you, everyone, for those comments and for those uh, inputs. Um, I want to call on the Secretary General to come and share a few words with us. And remember, SG, listening to the people, we are talking of a vision, a vision of peace. Thank you, thank you, comrades. Thank you, Nizautuzi Ambassador. Um, you will make ambassadors to run away. Uh, thank you very much, uh, esteemed guests, panelists, diplomats, intellectuals, academia members of the ANC, uh, program director, Dr. Oscar van Heerden, ladies and gentlemen of the media, who honored this platform of the ANC dialogue by covering this platform live on all channels and platforms. Thank you very much, so that we are not second guest. So you have seen we have not called a platform of friends who agree among themselves. Uh, what was interesting was the dialogue between Europe, Russia, and Norway. Um, we invited everybody, and they they apologized. We invited our friends from China. Uh, we invited uh, Ukraine. And we are honored by a number of African ambassadors uh, present here today. We invited uh, diplomats here at home and academia to share perspective on what is happening. Because here in South Africa, the national debate has shrinked and died. It's reduced to trending on social media, Twitter. Um, over and above about 140 characters and more, increased by Elon Musk. And then uh, they define a whole set of complex issues. What should be our attitude towards? Uh, there is no debate. Um, when President Mbeki writes a letter, is leaked, people don't debate the content. They attack the former president. And I say to ANC members, and they say I must not say I, I'm still in the ministry uh, mindset, I, Minister of Transport. So we say as the organization to our members, it cannot be when there is a debate, you kill it with insults and threatening people. You allow the debate, you engage. And that is what the ANC have taught us uh, over the years. And once more, I want to thank our panelists and everybody, and a good round of applause, and everybody. Uh, this is our second uh, dialogue. We had the first dialogue on the electricity. Um, uh, electricity, uh, load shedding, a crisis at UJ, and uh, this is our second, where we think it is important to engage in these debates and uh, invite uh, everyone to come and participate because this also inform and shape the ANC perspective. Because in thinking there is nothing static unless you suffer from initia. Then you cease to think. And then you see 
a problem to everyone who tries to be a thinker or bring innovation and new ideas. And I think uh, what built the ANC over the years is to allow the plurality of ideas and at the same time to allow even internal to have dissent. Because when you have a different view on a matter, it doesn't mean that uh, there is a challenge for the ANC. It means we are realizing growth in terms of ideas and we educate each other and we get to know better what other people and others are thinking in the organization. So, the historical relationship between Russia and Ukraine signifies the complexities underpinning the formation of the um, nation states. Very importantly, uh, states generally emerge through conquest, annexation, and subjugation. Uh, for the greater part of the 20th century, Ukraine was integral to the USSR until its collapse in 1991. In contrast, we underwent a difficult national reconciliation period to politically engineer a new society through, among others, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. The national question with regards to unity is a complex one. And in Ukraine, that has been compounded by the history between Russia and Ukraine, particularly the USSR period. The rationale behind the ANC position on non-alignment and anti-war posture, and which is a point I wish to emphasize. Those who don't understand us, they say we are neutral. We are not neutral. We have taken a stand and we are anti-war. So they want to reduce us to either be in favor of Ukraine or Russia. And talking about arms, when I was Minister of Transport, I uh, disallowed a plane full of arms flying out of South Africa to Ukraine to deliver weapons. And we declined that uh, through what is called an uh, FSOP, which is uh, permission to fly. And we declined that. An aeroplane full of arms out of South Africa and people approach us we want to deliver this to Ukraine to fight. We said this is against our position. 140 countries were on the other side, which were not counted to be pro, which was anti-war, which took a position of non-alignment in the United Nations. And recently I met with my friends and our friends in the European Socialist Party, the Executive Jared, I mean the Secretary General, um, and the President Stefan and uh, Giacomo Filabek. And then they argue like the ambassador of uh, Norway argues. They say we are in favor of the weakest, which is uh, Ukraine. Uh, but they don't say we'll give weapons and everything. And at least today you said we'll give weapons. And we want to discourage you from that. Because uh, weapons will not resolve uh, what is happening there. Even if you are on the side of the weakest, but weapons uh, to support and supply to Ukraine will not bring about uh, peace uh, in that part of the world. So since the end of the Second World War, uh, the ANC associated itself with the founding articles of the United Nations on the sovereignty of states. This is amplified by Article 33 of the United Nations Charter, which argues, I quote, the parties to any dispute, the continuance of which is likely to endanger the maintenance of international peace and security, shall first of all seek a solution by negotiation, inquiry, mediation, conciliation, arbitration, judicial settlement, resort to regional agencies or arrangements or other peaceful means 
of their own choice. Close quote. The ANC's national conference made the following observations with regards to Russia-Ukraine war. I quote, the ongoing war in Ukraine has far-reaching strategic geopolitical and economic consequences for the peoples of the world. This can no longer be described simply as a Russia-Ukraine war. It is primarily a conflict between the U.S. and U.S.-led NATO and Russia in pursuit of the objectives of the so-called Wolfowitz Doctrine. So what is Wolfowitz Doctrine? According to this doctrine, the United States should not allow that any country in the world should have the possibility in the post-Cold War period to challenge U.S. interests, especially its hegemony. In this regard, the U.S. geopolitical strategy has identified Russia and China as the two powers that must be contained, according to the Wolfowitz doctrine which underpins the United States foreign policy. Now that made uh, the ambassador of America to have nightmares, which is this particular assertion that is made by the ANC National Conference. Now, our non-alignment does not mean being impartial uh, on matters of justice. However, non-alignment remains relevant globally because many countries resolved that the agenda informing proxy wars by the big powers does not represent their aspirations, South Africa included. In uh, international relations, non-alignment give us the opportunity to be impartial peace brokers, and so we're able to participate in the African leaders' peace mission to Ukraine and Russia. Therefore, we will argue that non-alignment remains relevant with regards to wars, but we are aligned to justice. Part of what has come out in the international context as the consequence of Russia-Ukraine war has been the ICC verdict against President Putin. The pacifist policy posture by the ANC is not new. We have as an organization taken similar stances, premised on the sovereignty of states as per the United Nations Charter in this regard. Even our struggle against apartheid was peaceful until repression reached intolerable levels and were forced into engaging in military combat against the apartheid regime. And that is why we have called for cessation of hostilities and granting of sovereignty to the peoples of Western Sahara, Palestine, and the democratization of Eswatini and in all these instances through peaceful means. We have been opposed to wars in Iraq, Afghanistan, Sudan, Libya, Ethiopia, and so forth. It is also against this backdrop, backdrop that we stand opposed to the Cuban blockade, which undermines the sovereignty of that country on self-determination. We advocate for peace because that was the DNA of our political breakthrough in South Africa. And when war and repression failed, it was negotiated settlement that enabled democracy in South Africa. On the African Peace uh, Initiative, President uh, Cyril Ramaphosa participated in the African Leaders Peace Mission, meeting with, bro with both President Zelensky and President Putin to try end the war as a matter of agency. President Ramaphosa briefed us on the peace mission and that it was by and large a success. And that Lays and Munyela have actually given details of that today in the panel, particularly to the extent that the message of peace was effectively communicated to both leaders. The African leaders presented the 10-point plan, which among others highlighted the negative impact the war um, was having not only on the people of Ukraine and Russia, 
but other regions such as in Africa where food security has been compromised. This flies against the propaganda suggesting that because we belong to BRICS together with Russia, we are therefore pro-Russia in the conflict. South Africa's stance is that of anti-war, hence we call on de-escalation across the board. Our approach in solidarity with the like-minded African countries will strengthen the resolve on multilateral institutions as arbiters on the conflicts as opposed to unilateral military actions. This African leader's peace mission put Africa on the world map as champion for peaceful resolution of uh, conflicts. And I heard the, the ambassador when he was speaking and saying that the African leaders go to Europe to solve the conflict. That conflict is messing us up uh, here in the African continent and globally. And it was important for Africa to take a stand. And uh, we as Africa, we are, behind, we are behind that particular mission as undertaken by our leaders. And we're very much encouraged by our leaders in France this past week, speaking in one voice. And the message that coming out, we are not beggars. We are not beggars. And that is the message that come out in financial institutions as they democratize. We too must be given our standing. It must not be because we are made favors. And our president spoke at length about COVID-19, about the vaccines, and everything else that comes our way from President Mbeki till today. When I saw these leaders speaking and we saw them as young African leaders who were encouraged that we are back on the African Renaissance agenda. And that is what we want uh, from our leaders. Uh, we don't want sheepish leaders uh, who sell out our continent and compromise on the fundamentals. Even if we can be one, espousing non-alignment will stay non-aligned, non-aligned, because that is the principle we are prepared to stand for. We will not be woodwind, and neither we will be bullied uh, into taking up positions that does not resonate with what South Africa represents, with what Africa represents. And that is why we stand for this particular position. There is no doubt that the Ukraine-Russia war, the Russia-Ukraine war, signifies the complex evolution of the Ukrainian state and its historical links with Russia, including the years of USSR. And the professor uh, elaborated on this very well in the panel. Uh, the Russia-Ukraine war also signifies the proxy war uh, that the West has fought with the USSR during the Cold War and Russia post the collapse of the Soviet Union. While some may insist the Cold War is dead, there is no doubt that the war has been fueled partly by external geopolitical factors that can be attributed to the legacy of the Cold War with regards to encroachment. We must not be naive. We must ask the question, who stand to benefit for the continuation of this war? And that is the fundamental question that we must ask and it must be answered. While some may insist, like we said, that the Cold War is dead, we say it is not. Inasmuch as the U.S. could protest military presence of either Russia or China uh, in Cuba for the same reasons that we have the challenges of Ukraine, joining NATO as well as the U.S.-China stand over the South China Seas, mainly evolving around Taiwan. I saw Secretary of State Blinken in Russia. We just arrived with David Makura from Russia. You know, from China, sorry. <laughs> uh, of course, we just came from China. And when we arrived, we saw the Secretary of State saying that, no, our position on Taiwan is not something 
uh, that were rigid on. And then he said that in China. Here in South Africa, we say we are non-aligned. And then because we are a small fish, we are attacked, including questioning and threatening to redefine the trade relations between the two countries. When they know very well that uh, if that were to happen, it will impoverish our people here in terms of the Agoa trade and so on. We are very much interested in Agoa and will defend it. If Americans take it away from us, it will not be for the first time. The people of Zimbabwe, and I say this, the whole Zimbabwe ambassador is here in South Africa. Zimbabweans, not even under apartheid, cross the Limpopo to come here. They come because partly Zimbabwe is suffering from sanctions from the U.S. and the United Kingdom. And United Kingdom agreed with President Mbeki and Tony Blair that they will give 42 billion pounds for the land redistribution program, reform program in Zimbabwe. Because Zimbabwe from Lancaster, they were implementing what we tried here in South Africa, willing seller, willing buyer. For 10 years, that did not happen. And then they agreed they will come to the party. They never came to the party. Up until President Mugabe implemented a program of a land reform program. And then uh, that's where everything broke loose. But Mugabe, President Mugabe, was removed by his own comrades in a coup d'etat. Those comrades don't agree with that assertion, that it was a coup d'etat. President Mnagangwa came here, we gave him shelter. And then he went back to Zimbabwe after removing President Mugabe. There was a new president. Till today, they don't accept that the democratic outcome in Zimbabwe are the real ones. So they want their own person. That is what is called regime change. So we as South Africa do not subscribe to remove governments as we wish. We would have long removed what is happening in Swaziland. But we don't do it because we respect the sovereignty of nation state. And then we respect the Zimbabweans. We respect the Zimbabweans to the point that they, the Zimbabweans, if there are challenges in Zimbabwe, they must find solutions to Zimbabwe's problems. Today, they are crossing the river full of crocodiles. Zimbabwean people, undocumented in our country, simply because the Zimbabwean economy has collapsed and exacerbated also by sanctions. That's the topic nobody wants to have. In as much as all of these things are actually happening, it is important for us that we guarantee the sovereignty of nation states. And uh, when America changes its tune with regard to Taiwan and going to China and so on, it means these are two superpowers that respect each other. But we, here in South Africa, with our position, with regard to what must happen in Ukraine, we must suffer. And we must be threatened with sanctions and all of those things that must actually happen. We must be accused that we have given Russia weapons, even though that is a joke because we need weapons from Russia, either than the other way around. Because... Um, what weapons will we give to Russia? Roy Falk. I mean, uh, that is what we can give to them. So we need more weapons. We will need weapons from Russia rather than us giving them weapons. So we know, even post the Cold War, Russia Federation have built uh, a biggest capacity of war, weapons of war in their country. And uh, the world knows that. Even everybody else knows that. So our position with regard to our non-alignment is a position, historical position, is principled, and we are prepared uh, to stand for that. The test to global peace will be on how the international community navigates these geopolitical realities with ever tilting balance of power signified by the rise of China as a superpower amongst others. As the ANC we reiterate the message conveyed to Russia and Ukraine by the African leaders 
that the war must be ended as a matter of agency. In this regard, we call on all other countries to desist from fueling the conflict through military support, either to Ukraine or to Russia, instead of utilizing multilateral platforms to end the war. It was against this backdrop that we were dismayed when allegations were made that we could have exported military weapons to Russia. Besides the absurdity of the claims, as in fact we need weapons from Russia and not the other way around. And that is what we believe as the ANC we need to stand for in relation to the conflict of Russia and Ukraine. And we want to applaud the African leaders' mission and everyone else who work for peace uh, in uh, Russia Ukraine uh, conflict. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's, we are coming to the end now. Can I please call on Mashengi Bengumutsiri to come and do a vote of thanks for us? Um, SG and um, and thank you very much for the patience of your audience moderator it's not my meeting mine is to just do a quick um, vote of things and um, in that particular order I want to start off by acknowledging acknowledging our panel and uh, who has really stayed the course. Um, the SG has been acknowledged. I do wish to acknowledge um, members of the National Executive Committee that are present here tonight. Um, Sis Lindy, I know that we had to frog march you from your many other commitments for you to represent the National Executive